hard. Okay. Um, so, sweet. So, uh, can you see the brainstorming slide? Mm. Oh, I guess no, I need to no. share my screen too. Okay. Is that better? Can you yeah. see the brains? You should see it now. Okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, welcome to the Innovation Algebra Meetup. Um, I'm trying to do it like every two weeks or so on a Friday at a time that a lot of people all over the world can participate. And I'm actually considering doing it at other times too and repeating it a few times. Um, not sure exactly, you know, depending on the uh, the interest. So today's topic is brainstorming, which is essentially brainstorming and innovating with AI. Just so you know, I, I can't see the chat window. So if you type something in there, I probably will miss it. So, you know, just speak up. You're welcome to interrupt me. Um, so what I'm going to do is mostly focus on brainstorming and, and do create three case studies, uh, Dr. Innovation, self-simming, where I'm going to simulate myself, very entertaining, and something called the torture chamber. Um, and then uh, we have, we're very lucky, we have two uh, professionals that are going to actually uh, help us, uh, guest speakers, if you want. Uh, Natalia is going to be talking about AI in the modern workplace. Uh, should be a very spirited conversation, I think. And also Larry, um, was doing some really cool stuff with really deep personas, uh, and we will focus on data analysis. But before I'm starting, I actually want to um, just point out that there is a, a site now, innovationalgebra.com. You can go there. It actually just goes to the Luma page. You will see most of the links to all of the stuff there. As I said, I will also send it out in an email to everyone. Um, and I actually want to start a little bit going back, talking about concepts that uh, or ideas that this group has been working on, that I've been working on, and other people, and actually goes a little bit longer back uh, to last year, to stuff that we did at the Hacker Dojo. So, and it's basically just talking a little bit about definitions. Um, so, when I say innovation, uh, I don't necessarily mean radical innovation. It could also be very incremental. Like you are, you have a business problem. You you need to come up with some idea or a new process or a policy or a product or a service or even just solve a problem that you have. Let's say with uh, your employees or something like that. Uh, at a, at this point, you always ask yourself, what should I do next? You know, what is the thing that I should do? Um, and if you want to be truly the best in the world, you really have to consider, okay, what is the best option? You know, what are other people doing? What is the most innovative, innovative solution? Um, and at that point, you, if you have the right tools, you can actually make really excellent decisions. And that's what a lot of innovation algebra is about. Another term that we like to throw around is the knowledge frontier. Imagine everything humanity knows is fits in the circle that just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And the experts are sort of sitting on the circle. This is where we all want to be. Um, and the innovators are pushing this, making the circle bigger and bigger. Of course, the circumference of the circle is just growing and it becomes harder and harder to stay on the circle. And you sort of have to imagine AI is the thing that's going to keep you on or inside the knowledge frontier where you need to be to innovate. Um, and for the original gangsters, we also have to talk about inflection points. Uh, uh, we pretty much beat this uh, topic to death last year at the Hacker Dojo as part of the Philosopher's Corner. So, so inflection point is actually a, a trajectory change. It's like a line, uh, if you imagine a line, it changes uh, its direction, either positive or negative. Now. These future inflection points are really important uh, because these are actually where disruption is happening, new things are happening. And the question is, 
you know, how do you create inflection points not only for yourself personally, but also for your business? Uh, and that's actually what a lot of innovation algebra is about, is how to generate these inflection points. Just to sort of put it in context, this is actually a slide I used last time, uh, is that uh, we have the circle, this RNG thing here with the knowledge frontier, and we have particular inventions that have happened. Um, as you can see here, uh, when it comes to communication, um, you know, a lot of things have happened and stuff has sp sped up dr dramatically as innovators are essentially pushing this knowledge frontier. And we are interested in what the future inflection points are. So this list, you know, global satellite coverage, augmented reality communication, all of these things um, are things that we expect to actually happen in the future. And what innovators do is they try to predict and time this. You know, you can't just have nano about medi mediated communication, right? A lot of the tech doesn't exist. So a lot of innovation is about timing. Are you at the right place? Um, are you at the right place in the frontier? Can you push it a little bit further in a particular direction? So, um, so if you think about mapping out inflection points, um, I try to make a diagram here. Uh, sort of imagine you are walking through this forest and there are paths that you can take. And you're going to go either left or right. You know, your whole history, why you are here in your life is the, the, the decisions you made before. Of course, some of them you might regret, but you don't really know if you made a different decision, what would have happened. So I call this past sort of the land of regrets because most of the time we think about, okay, I should have done this or should have done that, but we don't really know what the outcomes would be. It would have been worse or better for you innovation-wise. In general, I'm using sort of the y-axis here is like, hey, this is something good happening to you. And if you go down, it's something bad, right? Or, or something you don't want. So, so the future is interesting because it has many paths that you could potentially follow. And there are many inflection points and you can you still have the freedom to influence this. It's the land of opportunity for everyone. But the question is, how do you experience this thing? How do you actually think about all the things, the, all the innovations, all the steps, all the decisions that you need to make when you cannot predict the future, right? How do I experience this? I mean, it's sort of a very abstract thing. So uh, we started talking about this uh, last year uh, at the Hacker Dojo, and we invented this thing, this theoretical machine called the inflection point generator. It's this machine, it's a mythical machine um that has a button you press this button and an inflection point is generated for you and we imagined all different types of implementations of such a machine and there are actually a whole bunch of them if you go to my linkedin you will actually see all this type of things that would influence influence inflection points and what's interesting now is from then when we had this philosophical conversations about this is that the world has dramatically changed. We can actually peer more into the future using AI. And that's actually what innovation algebra is about. It's the question, how much of inv innovation is algorithmic? Is there a recipe behind it that if we follow this recipe, we can create inflection points for ourselves, for our businesses, for our professional lives, and so on. And the interesting bit is, and I'm probably more on the bullish side here is that I think there's a lot of parts of innovation that are actually like a recipe. If you follow this recipe, you can innovate. Now, of course, we're really talking about core parts of thinking about innovations. Like, hey, I'm going to have an idea. Somebody still needs to do it or you need to delegate it or you know, there's some follow through, some execution you need to do. But at least you have the idea, the starting point. We don't have AIs to actually do our jobs for us completely today, but you know maybe that will happen in the future too. So what's interesting is that we can imagine a toolbox now for professionals to work beyond the knowledge frontier. 
to imagine all the paths that you can take. Um, and essentially, the idea here is to simulate the future and take a look at all the possible paths you can, have the computer help you evaluate them, and make decisions based on that. So you're essentially optimizing your path for your future. The tools that we have, that we know that would work, is definitely generative AI, right? Um, we have tools now to create expert personas. So you can actually ask advice from somebody, a virtual person, to help you make decisions. We have new ways to make abstract or implicit thinking explicit um, using uh, frameworks. This is actually in our last meetup, we talked about that, how, how we don't really know how, how to perfectly do things until we really truly write it down. Um, and that's so you have all these different techniques like TRIZ, Scamper, Business Model Canvas, you know, all the stuff you learn in business school and product managers to actually create a framework, how to think. And AI can actually apply these things um, for you automatically. Most of that was in previous conversation. I think we have a question maybe. Oh, okay. So um, related to this is something else that I've been working on called Deep, which is actually a, a project. You can find the link on the Luma page uh, which is trying to figure out where is the knowledge frontier. So these are AI algorithms that say, this is something that's near the knowledge frontier. I don't have time to talk about it. Um, so I'm just gonna move on and maybe some other meetup, we have that. And then a lot of stuff that we're focusing on is what I call self prompting. So imagine you have all these possible paths you can take in the future and you cannot, sit in front of chat GPT and say, try this, try this, try this, you know, what if this and so on, you sort of need to have the thing run on autopilot. It then needs to explore a lot of these things. So it needs to prompt itself. It needs to think a little bit. It says, oh, okay, I came up with this good idea. Let me try the next step. So these self-prompting um, chat GPT prompts make it much easier to explore this, you know, the knowledge frontier and go beyond it. And uh, innovation algebra is in, in its core is that it's a self-prompting framework. It uses business strategies uh, and idea formulation. It essentially creates a plan. You think about stuff and it executes it and you can influence it to, to peer into the future and to solve problems, to create inflection points for yourself. So uh, we won't be talking about innovation algebra itself. I'm, I'm just gonna be talking about brain simming, which is sort of a different approach. We use different personas to actually talk to each other in a, like a brainstorming happening inside the computer uh, to come up with ideas. There are other things that uh, I'm working on. One of them is called Alpha Prompt, which is also a, a very structured self-prompting, very scientific way to uh, come up with ideas. And something which uh, I have not talked about much called KF Push, which is actually logic beyond the, the knowledge frontier, uh, which focuses on rapid ideation, creating lots of really high quality ideas. Um, but let's, uh, I'm just gonna skip on this. This is just a little slide on innovation algebra. Let's talk about brain simming. So when you think about brainstorming, typically the professionals will tell you, hey, you need to put different personas together uh, you know, certain teams are better than others uh, to create uh, a successful brainstorming session. So uh, I started with this and tried to figure out, okay, what type of personalities do we need actually to, to create ideas in the computer with actually talking to each other, right? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of textbook stuff. This is from uh, Belbin uh, with different types of characters and so on. Um, but I ended up uh, creating a whole series of them. The first one is called Dr. Innovation. Um, so Dr. Innovation is actually the team leader. He's the moderator of this team. Um, and I created a bunch of uh, people, the professor. He is essentially the expert in a lot of topics, but he's also a naysayer. Uh, you'll see in a minute. Actually the most irritating person I've ever met, even though he's a virtual person. Um, then there is Dr. Pryor Art. You always need to know 
what other people are doing. And he keeps on reminding you about this. Mr. Visionary is always sort of living a little bit more in the future than the rest, maybe a little bit disconnected from reality, but he just pushes the envelope. Then humanitarian, which is an ethicist and engineering guru that can help you with stuff uh, when you do engineering. And the system also uses, uh, invites domain experts. And to make things interesting, there's a, a special part of this problem called Murphy's Law, which actually makes things go wrong. So these in this brainstorming sessions, things go wrong and the team have to react to it. So I'll show you some other things where things really go wrong in the torture chamber. Um, but let's just look at Dr. Innovation. So what is it? It's a really long prompt. It's available on the brain simming site, the website. You essentially just load it up. This is a link on the site. You can just start uh, clicking on it and then it will load it up in chat GPT for you. The interesting thing that it has, it has these contrastive personalities that sort of somehow work together to brainstorm. It has domain experts. The domain experts are very shallow. They don't, they're not as deep as some of the things that Larry is creating. Um, it also uses thinking frameworks, things like mind mapping, six thinking hats, Tris and Scamper, which innovation algebra has too. So these are just ways to uh, come up with new ideas. It has this failure simulation in there with uh, uh, Murphy's law. It also has uh, some steps to do focused innovation. So to prevent this, the AI from going off topic, and it also can create meeting minutes. Okay, so that's sort of the prompt you just type in. So I'm gonna go through some examples. Uh, the first one is we're trying to innovate uh, to create an undersea habitat uh, for 100 people at 60 feet depth. Okay, it's just an arbitrary thing that I try to. What's in that I'm trying here, the, the reason why I'm picking such an exotic topic that I don't know about anything about in neither of you probably is to show you that you can explore beyond your own knowledge frontier. So you can literally start working on any area you want. So, so you just type in the prompt, design an underwater habitat, whatever, and then Dr. Innovation will introduce the team and also create experts. In this case, it creates a deep sea specialist and modeler maven. Um, and it starts by asking questions to the team. You know, in this case, the, it asks the professor, what's your initial assessments of the feasibility and potential challenge of, of creating such an underwater habitat? And then to control this conversation, I don't actually need to do anything. I just type in continue. The thing is self-prompting, it runs all by itself. So the professor starts uh, by responding um, and then other people start, uh, other of these experts in the team starts responding too. See, so for example, see here, the professor jumps in, talks about it. And then Dr. Prior Art says, listen, here is something that's been done by somebody else. Um, so the whole idea is it's self-prompting. If, if you don't interact with it, you just type continue, 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 and the system runs automatically, right? Uh, everyone has, of course, their own opinions, uh, but the prompt is also um, set up in such a way that these characters are interacting with each other. So this interpersonal interaction, but they literally can ask questions to each other, right? Um, uh, so that they can actually start agreeing or disagreeing on certain things like real humans would, would do. Um, and some of them, since the prompt is designed to ground the whole conversation, will say, for example, listen, let's not go there. Let's put this in the parking lot. So they start behaving like real humans. Um, and in some cases, you know, they can, this, they can, get into arguments with each other. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, you know, AIs argue, arguing with each other. Um, and once you've gone, you've stepped through this process 
and you sort of get to a point where you think, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting tired of just typing continue, you can ask it to give the meeting minutes. And it will give you a basic overview of what happened in the conversation. Um, it could make a list of things that were explored and also extract the novel things, uh, the noteworthy knowledge from this. So it's a fully automated process, essentially. Um, of course, it's much faster and much cheaper than actually having a real meeting. And in many cases, the stuff that you get back is actually, I think, personally, is just really high quality. Um, so you now you might say, okay, Hannes, that's that's cool, but I don't care about undersea habitats, or I'm not really a true, I'm not that type of innovator. And my reaction would be is like, you really have to imagine things a little bit different than you imagine. Now you have, we all have to shift our minds to the future. Um, how will we personally use this? And to illustrate this, I'm going to actually simulate myself. So what you do is you write, like I did here, a problem statement of yourself. So I'm a solopreneur, I'm a software architect, I have some skills like public speaking and community building, I've founded some companies, my current project is Innovation Algebra, little background here what I'm doing, it's Apache 2 license so everyone can use it, it was launched a few months ago, it's a small community of 20 people or so using it, it's tiny, right? We have enthusiastic users using it in business and professional services. The project is super underdeveloped. I just basically threw it out there. Uh, there's a few repos. We have a two weeks meetup, a Discord. And now the questions come. What should I do with this? What are the obvious paths I should follow? Can this be turned into a business? So I think everyone can resonate with this. You know, you are stuck. You're stuck on the knowledge frontier. You want to push beyond, see what's there. How do you do it? Well, just type in where you are, right? One question, Hans. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, there is any limit in the amount of uh, information that you, you put to describe you or how many interactions that you can hold in one session? Uh, is the uh, chat GPT get tired uh, in the same way that humans and say, uh, that's well, <laughs> uh, it does. Typically with innovation algebra and with brain simming, about 40 minutes of talking or typing, it's sort of the IQ drops dramatically. That's for chat GPT. If you use Claude, however, you can actually go a really, really long time. You'll probably get tired before Claude gets tired. So with Claude, it's very easy to upload whole files. You can take your website, you know, and just upload it and say, hey, you know, let's talk about this. Let's brain some that. So um, at least that's in my experience how it works. So, And to be honest, di different technologies, Claude and ChatGPT, Llama, all these new models, Falcon, they are behaving very, very differently. Um, it's sort of striking how different they are and how and what type of things they do for example claude refuses to talk to me about certain things which i think it should but you know it doesn't want it to think it's things not it thinks it's not ethically correct to talk about it so very very bizarre but anyway anyway so this is harness's problem i suggest you start simming yourself too and then the weirdest thing starts happening in the intro suddenly you appear the computer is talking for me here. I typed in this thing and it suddenly I'm part of the conversation. So it's actually putting words in my mouth. So, and uh, I mentioned before that the prof, the professor, the naysayer is a very irritating uh, persona. Um, and he immediately says innovation algebra is, I'm not impressed with it. <laughs> There's been lots of attempts. So it's sort of, I on purpose actually designed it to be extreme naysayer because in innovation, uh, I'm you know I'm entrepreneur, failure is just 
part of the game and you're going to be dealing with a lot of people that's saying hey this is not going to work and it's good to have that opinion um and you know even though i feel like when i want to beat up the prof i think he has, brings a valuable perspective to me so um what i want to mention there is at the bottom it says humanitarian um it's it picks up that i'm using apache 2 license which is essentially open business friendly license for uh, all the prompts and stuff everything i'm doing so it picks up on that so um then there was a long conversation about me uh summing myself and at some point i type on it and it talks about github and so on i'm just alighting most of that conversation um I say, okay, GitHub resonates with me. And this is an idea that I've been playing around with. So Innovation Algebra and some of the new stuff, KF Push that I'm working on can generate really high quality ideas in any area. So many ideas that I cannot possibly do anything with them. Uh, the only thing that I consider is making a public database for it. So I type it in, yes, GitHub resonates with me, blah, blah. And I'll suddenly, uh, myself is talking about in more in better English uh, what appeals to me um, and then the professor chimes in and says a public database of ideas fraught with challenges intellectual property issues and so on right I, I actually know that myself I've actually done my own research a little bit um, and but Dr. Prior Art jumps in and says oh there are other open innovation platforms Innocentive, open IDEO and so on. So it really starts helping. Um, the conversation goes a little bit off track here. And then I have to come back and say, hey, look, like, listen, we're talking about a database that's completely fully generated by AI for ideas. Anyway, so you can interact. You just don't always need to just say continue. Again, my virtual self is talking here to the team. Uh, I'm talking here about encouraging open collaboration. Um, type in continue. It's an endless meeting that's being simulated. So it actually simulates time here. So two weeks later, the team reconvenes. We're talking about, we're starting to talk about creating actually uh, a license for these ideas. Um, then a whole bunch of other conversations go on. And then actually, I just say, oh, okay, what is the text of the license now that should be developed for the site? Um, it comes up with something. Uh, and then I just ask, oh, what does the team think about it? And then each of them actually gives sensible uh, responses, right? The conversation then actually went on and on and on and actually created several versions of the license and so on and started actually working on my idea. So, and of course, everyone will have a completely different experience, but the reality is I probably would not have, if I just thought about it for a few minutes, I probably wouldn't have pushed it as far as I did here um, with, with the system. So um, the self-simming, I think, really can help all of us to explore all these paths of the future, right? So, and the doctor innovation is actually, um, uh, a tame version of something called the torture chamber, which is a prompt two that I published, which actually focuses on running virtual experiments and failures using Murphy's law with extremely abrasive personalities. These are not personalities you normally would find uh, in brainstorming. The M factor, which is the Murphy's law factor, is like how many percent of the experiments they do actually fail uh, is set very high, 95%. So pretty much as a team in a very adverse situation. Uh, the project they're working on is to create a, a launcher for uh, a weather balloon. Uh, it's just a topic that I sort of am a little bit aware of because some of my friends are actually doing this. They're launching what, small weather balloons uh, that travel all around the world and get monitored. It's it's a very interesting topic, uh, how to control these things, You know how high they go, how much power you, and weight you need to actually make this thing work and so on. So there's about a zillion things that can go wrong with these balloons and the simulation because of the M factor 
they pretty much run into everything. Here on the right, you see, for example, GPS signal disruptions and so on. It really goes extremely deep. I found the conversation very um, interesting because it pushes, it really starts to push into areas where humans normally don't go or normally, you know, you don't explore all these areas. So um, it also comes up with some hilarious stuff. For example, here's a comment from uh, Professor Aeronautics. It shows the abrasive personality. How delightfully obvious, but if you're going to study correlations, maybe you also examine the alignment of the planets and the brand of coffee we're drinking. Who knows what you might find? So um, it's interesting. There is another simulation called uh, diplomatic uh, brainstorming, where I've used the traditional personalities that are sort of recommended, like, hey, in a team, in a company, we put people with these skills together and these type of thinking. And they actually did not innovate as much as really putting these abrasive personalities together that are sort of battling out these ideas, right? If somebody says, the visionary says, listen, we're going to do this in the future. The professor says, no, you're not grounded in reality. They're not nice to each other. And so the question is even, should we be nice to AI or not? So, um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, at this point, you either love the ideas like, oh, okay, I'm going to simulate my own future or it scares the hell out of you, right? Uh, because essentially we're talking about innovation being taken away from a lot of people. It's done, done by, by machines. But the reality is that, you know, AI is going to be your new friend. They are going to be, they already your coworkers. I know some people in this group actually use them like that. They are going to be your advisory boards, right? AI is my co-founder, right? I am a solo entrepreneur, so I use it all the time. And some would even be your boss. So, so I looked a little bit, okay, you know, in the last one, um, will be your boss. There's actually several companies which have now AIs as the CEO. So NetDragon WebSoft is a Chinese company, which funny enough, I actually worked for. Uh, a long time ago, indirectly, it's a big conglomerate. Um, very charismatic uh, founder. Um, essentially built um, Star Trek, the Enterprise from Star Trek. That's his headquarters in China. So I've been there. It's totally insane. Um, also, in a few weeks, Deep Brain will actually be showing off virtual like fully animated personas that you're talking to. This is something I discovered on the Cerebral Valley website. And there's another uh, company um, that also replaced their CEO with uh, uh, Una uh, with, a, with an AI that I was sort of supervised by, by humans, right? So anyway, so that is actually a good point to... Um, give the reins over to Natalia to talk about, you know, the crazy future, I guess, that's that's coming our way. So I asked Natalia to come up with three questions, which you can see here. Um, Natalia, maybe just uh, tell folks, you know, how you fit into the world, what, what are you up to, and then go for it. Yeah, I have to first say that talking to uh, just uh, 10 or 20 participants who are all senior and um, highly intelligent is probably more stressful than <laughs> talking to hundreds and hundreds of PhD students that I used to uh, give presentations to. So I feel honored to be here. Do you hear me well? Yes, Looking great. Fine. Great. So yeah, I have a background in computational neuroscience. I, uh, I did a PhD here in the Netherlands and I was studying causality in the brain. So how the information flows uh, between like large scale brain networks. And then uh, after my PhD, I moved to career advisory because I felt that uh, the problems of today's job market are so much more like down to earth and applied 
like to, so the, the problems I could solve there are much more like applied uh, in real life than what I was doing in my short uh, yet intensive <laughs> scientific career. And uh, I think it was a good choice. And I have to say after ChatGPT came out, now I see how complex this problem uh, actually is. So uh, yeah, so in my daily life, I mostly uh, help individuals uh, self-navigate in the job market. And I built some tools, including uh, one aptitude test, uh, which we call the ontology of value test. That is, um, that is a tool uh, which um, gives gui guidelines to, uh, especially like young people who are entering the job market for which career path to, to best choose given their mentality, personality, and natural working style. Um, and also which roles on teams they might potentially uh, fit best. And if you'd like to, I, I can uh, generate an access code. If you'd like to take this test, I'm, I'm most happy to give you the access. So just let me know, just poke me through LinkedIn or uh, here on chat and I will just give you, give you, give you the access. Um, and so today's topic is uh, something relatively new for me to explore uh, because again, like I come from academia, I'm not coming from corporate world. So uh, investigating how AI is changing corporate world is also new to me. Uh, but yeah, I will just give you a very like high level, uh, high level picture today. Um, Hannes prepared an amazing presentation. I, 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 I didn't, but I have to add this one slide that I made to, um, to illustrate my point of view at the, how the job market is changing these days. Uh, but yeah, let's just uh, start from... Start from the back. Yep. Here you go. Is someone having a question? No? Uh, yeah, so the first question was, uh, in what ways does the AI transform operations and human resources in large organizations? So obviously uh, the AI ops is the uh, new big trend right now. And um, like, I think most of us comes from the startup world or actually um, is currently a part of the startup world. And obviously startups uh, tend to adopt new technologies much faster than large uh, organizations that are much more inert. Uh, however, uh, well, it would be delusional uh, not to at least try to incorporate AI into operations for any organization today. So we, like all of them, they have to stay competitive. And obviously, despite uh, being inert and having more constraints as large organizations, they still have to, they have to uh, make use of these new opportunities that uh, AI gives to stay in the game. So obviously one, uh, one application that AI has is uh, recruitment and uh, management of human resources. Um, well, in human resources, um, most like, so AI is obviously applied to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, fulfill the low value tasks and the kind of repetitive tasks such as benefits management and uh, common employee questions, like us answering to common employee questions and uh, about procedures and policies and also processing leave forms, etc. So that's uh, an obvious application. But uh, rec most recently, they are also, AI is also used in recruitment. And here, obviously, we have um, uh, a lot of uh, problems, which I might actually, yeah, mention right now. Because so that's a question number two, but let's just... Uh, Let's just touch this topic because it's quite controversial. So uh, in recruitment, uh, using AI algorithms is, um, is generating lots of biases because, of, well, the, um, uh, they, uh, the models learn on the prior data. So like they, they pick up on patterns and sometimes given how many parameters um, and high, like high, dim high dimensional features they pick up on, uh, we cannot uh, like even, um, engineers working on those models no longer can recognize what kind of features these models actually actually uh, pick up on. So, uh, so th this this leads to biases, and um, no wonder that uh, the groups that were underrepresented before and the uh, kind of um, 
penalized by the algorithms used before. Now in times of AI and that data mining, they are even more underrepresented and more penalized. And this is this comes as a problem, for instance, for women in IT, because that that's very very like the um, algorithms work in a Bayesian way. So if you submit a hundred CVs from the prior employees and 90 out of 100 are male CVs, then obviously the algorithm will learn that the, the, it will do the profiling of an ideal employee for the role. And it would infer that since the majority of uh, seats were occupied by men, that probably means that a male uh, employee is like better performing than a female. So obviously that's a, uh, that's a wrong inference, but but that's exactly what the what the outcome will be. So, the uh, like um, male gender will be kind of up uh, up weighted in the overall algorithm compared to female. So, and this obviously works also for combinations of features that are sometimes like much more um, complex than just gender. So they are increasingly harder to recognize in the recruitment process, and this is. This is a problem that doesn't have a clear solution because again, uh, some of these uh, features are so like complex that uh, it's extremely hard to uh, filter filter these biases out in the recruitment process. And this is hard to hard to solve because um, obviously, especially in a hard market, just like mentioned before, we have um, very um, challenging times for employees and for. Uh, job hunters, and especially in times like this, competitive um, like top IT companies, they receive thousands of applications per seat. So um, filtering out the good candidates without using AI is almost impossible. Um, that's why uh, that's why uh, there is no effective solution for this uh, for this problem just yet. Natalia, question. Yep. So. Since every school kid I know is using chat GPT now for doing essays and all sorts of stuff, as the younger generation is learning how to use AI much more effectively than people that are actually in the job market today. And so, you know, the skill of, you know, using AI properly uh, will essentially skew to a younger generation that's entering in the web place, uh, workplace and, and the older generation that not is not familiar with this. I mean, it just seems that, you know, if you're an older, older person, more established in the workforce, you're gonna have a serious time competing, uh, or hard to compete with a younger generation that just grows up with this stuff, right? Well, I, I would challenge this view because uh, actually that, that's, uh, that's, another, that's another point because um, what AI is actually doing, especially like in software development, it eliminates the junior roles, right? So all the roles in which you uh, have certain knowledge, but it's like the um, projects that you can uh, take on are not as complex. So you basically are like your responsibilities are reduced to simple tasks on like low level. Uh, without much uh, ideation, without uh, putting work from other people together, without management, without logistics, um, without vision. So just, just doing like simple bits of, of, of single tasks. So this is what historically like junior employees were always occupied with before they learn enough to like, like climb the ladder and become more senior. So there's a, there is a knowledge gap right now. So those people who come uh, new to the job market have now hard time jumping over uh, because again, the, the simple jobs are getting automatized. So, uh, but this is, this is a huge problem right now because to become a senior employee, you have to go through the phase of uh, being a junior employee first, but there are currently like, there's a decreasing amount of jobs for junior employees. And those who are indeed like at school right now and who are, like naturally learning how to work with AI, uh, they will have to learn much more than their predecessors to be able to enter the job market right now. So that mm, I would say that uh, we are not on the last position just yet. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so hard to uh, to predict, but I think 
yeah, the, I would say that uh, the like young people who are in high school right now have uh, immensely harder job to enter the job market than we, we did. Yeah. Thanks for that insightful contribution. Yeah. Now you're talking like a like a bot. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. No, this is also a problem. Like uh, sometimes uh, this is also the one of the problems about using AI in large organizations because the using AI just uh, like um, decreases trust overall. And I also see that ever since the chat GPT came out, I, I myself sometimes, I mean, I trust my subcontractors. I also, I'm like, just like Hannes, I'm a solopreneur. I have subcontractors and sometimes some of them, like whenever they give me like well-rounded responses that are like polite, kind, neutral, well-written without typos. And I, then I ha have that weird feeling of, is it, is it you or is it a chat GPT? Because I don't really feel like, I feel like you did a lousy job and instead of just telling me what you think, you just left it to chat GPT to talk for you. And that's like, I would rather hear a response that is full of typos and like not even very polite, but like truthful than just, uh, yeah, the uh, chat GPT's version of it. So yeah, this is, uh, this is something I, I see. I see that problem and it's also, very well-known problem in large organizations that once you have a lot of people talking and mostly online because that's how like working in teams uh, looks today um, and mostly texting all day long then sometimes like the, the trust goes down because you never like you never really know if you're talking to your colleague or you're talking to chat gpt um, i'm actually so curious also I, mean, I think we have a bunch of educators on the call too um not sure daniel if you want to jump in and you know uh what well, do you I, think oh uh, well that's i i agree I, and i like that analogy that you're talking about um you know as i'm coaching my students how to use it and i know larry is um and then to get their output into assessments that we've got to mark and see we're sort of cut we're, we're um we're stuck in the middle here because um we don't have an official policy as such. So I've got to refer to it as that that I shall not mention type thing. So it's kind of like we're stuck, you know, trying to rock in a hard place um, because a lot of academia at this stage don't know how to deal with it. But as we coach them and I coach them to, say, create project charters or whatever um, they need to get the output, I'm also... Um, coaching them to make it so that it resonates with a project or something that they would write about. It's not something that, you know, that they can't put their own, they've got to be able to mold it into their own words so they still stay human. You know, I suppose is that word that pops up, the humistic value that, um, or humatide or whatever we may call it into the future, because that's also the same as if we, flick through Twitter, um, you know, I have that a thread of 300 people that I've um, built. And I know already now that, you know, those that are just using and, and, the, and the clickbait, you know, the whole um, thing of just using um, the AI to generate their clicks. So, you know, it's almost like, um, they alert, they get after a while they start losing out because they you just push them out you don't even don't even stop you, you skim read and get, gather what you want out of it and then you don't engage type thing larry are you here are you on the call larry yeah yeah i'm here <laughs> so i think larry I is probably the person that uses chat gpt the most in education right like you uh, creating scripts and personas for your students and they are using that if it's, you know, that's sort of their new teacher, right? Um, I, what, um, I just want to comment on uh, uh, two things about uh, what uh, Natalia uh, uh, mentioned. The first thing is that you can actually use, uh, technically, you can use ChatGPT to create all kinds of uh, grammatical errors, random uh, typos and so you can actually use it to um, simulate um, a particular, like, because I teach a second language, so you can actually simulate a particular level 
uh, of, of English in uh, second language education. But, um, uh, but, but here's the thing, because I'm teaching uh, my students to use the, uh, you know, chat GPT um, in, in very sophisticated ways. And I think uh, what I observe uh, is that, uh, I think last time Kyle mentioned that you have to, uh, chat GPT enables you to become a 80% reviewer. Uh, my experience is that um, in order for the students to be able to use chat GPT in the right way, or wrong way, a sophisticated way that they have to graduate to become the team leader, which means that they, they need this um, uh, learning process to understand how uh, things are actually done in, in a uh, process. Um, so it's not very easy for them to actually create something that is not like in my area, for example, like language uh, uh, education, actually you can identify um, their uh, if they use chat GPT, it's very easy to identify that because their answers are almost uh, perfect. And they don't know how to, like so far, I haven't seen anyone who's able to create uh, imperfect answers, which says something about how they use GPT, uh, pretty much like they're using Google, I think. So I think they're still, you know, but it, it's the gap is going to be filled uh, once uh, more sophisticated ways are published, and I don't think is so. So, so I think there's a probably a problem in higher education uh, because it, so in my experience, uh, for using very sophisticated prompts, the articles generated passes turn it in a hundred percent. Uh, it shows zero similarity. Uh, so the most sophisticated uh, plagiarism uh, detection system can't detect anything written by GPT. And uh, my experience is that a lot of the um, uh, tutors, uh, instructors, uh, professors at universities, are more, these are North American universities, they tend to be, because they don't know the students in person, so they can't, uh, accuse the students of using GPT uh, in the first place without uh, any evidence. But the problem is that they, they can't find any evidence anymore. So it's, it, it's a huge problem actually. Um, but so far the students need to, uh, they're, they're, they haven't graduated to become team leader yet. So what they're writing has some kind of, uh, there, there's uh, a trails of them using GPT. If I may add something to this, what Clary just said, I think that um, the uh, willingness to and the temptation to use the chat GPT even when not recommended by students also might be a function of what the like system is. So the system of uh, grade grading is. So actually, um, I live in the Netherlands, but I'm Polish and I, I studied in Poland. And, Poland and the Netherlands have two different educational systems. In Poland, uh, when you are a university student, you go to an exam, and then the, especially at, at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics, the competitive faculties, uh, the, the professor like brings together all the um, uh, exams, all the tests, and typically they are so hard to, uh, to solve that the most of the most of the students have less than half of the points. So the Gaussian has a mean somewhere like less than 50%. And the professor just looks at the Gaussian, like Gaussian curve of the results and basically decides, okay, I just cut off like the lowest 20% of students or lowest 30% or sometimes lowest 50% depends on their taste and all the distribution of scores. So basically that's how the grading uh, is done. And what that means is, to pass, you have to be better than the rest or at least average. So that means whether or not you pass depends whether you have anyone behind you in the, in the race. And in the Netherlands, the system is different. So your grade is independent from other people's grades. And it's always like a scale is always between zero and 10. And if you, there are points for every assignment in the test and the, the total is, 100% and that's 10, zero is zero. And whatever percentage of points you get, it gets transferred like in your, on a linear scale to zero to 10. So 
you have 75% of points, you get seven and a half. That's it. And doesn't matter what the other students did and how hard the exam was. So this system is much more like resilient to AI because again, like your score is not dependent on other people's scores. Whether, whether, whereas in Poland, if others kind of, let's say cheat, and use AI when they're not supposed to, uh, they kind of jump over you and then you don't pass, right? So th b basically I think that there should be more, um, more discussion in education as well for how to incentivize uh, like working on your own when, when recommended or where necessary versus using AI. For instance, uh, if, if they're like, if uh, using AI in homeworks is not, not uh, yeah pref preferred then yeah there should be some uh, way of uh, incentivizing students not to do it yeah so that, that that was just a little digression because I feel like where we are born and how we are taught at school and how we are graded really has impact on uh, whether we are incentivized to use AI or not. Anyways, uh, let me come back to the question. Like I'm on the. Uh, yeah, on our topic today. Um, so yeah, the, there are many areas in which uh, the AI is utilized in large organizations today. It's also training employees, obviously, and there are sec sectors where it already became 100% automatized. Like for instance, in training pilots in aviation, they are usually like learning to, to fly in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. So, there is no human factor anymore. Basically, pilots are trained in flying by machine, not by human. So, um, yeah, the like the automatization is obviously going higher and higher in many sectors, and uh, in employee engagement and performance management as well. And also, what is quite controversial uh, in employee well-being and support. So, uh, organizations are like introducing coaching systems and uh, support systems to their employees. They also often track the work-life balance by re recording the working hours through their uh, internal systems and then um, yeah, implement bots that um, basically conversate with the employee to, to try to pick up the sentiment and uh, implement the coaching strategy if necessary. And this is, uh, this is controversial because there is a lot of debate right now whether um, a AI-based um, support system can be better than a real like human uh, coach or therapist. And there are differing, like th there are studies which give like, like um, uh, ver variable answers to this question. So, there is no consensus whether or not it's possible. But what is what is for for sure true is that uh, well AI is definitely more patient and more um, available twenty four seven. So at least in that uh, domain, AI is uh, is useful. But yeah, this is uh, this is a highly controversial topic. Um, and. Um, uh, and now let's talk a little bit more about the caveats of using AI uh, in large organizations. Um, so first of all, the compliance that was mentioned before. Uh, so like usually, it's usually the case that, um, uh, that like regulations come a long time after, after technology. Like one good example is the blockchain industry which is still highly unregulated after 10 plus years of, uh, of, of uh, that market flourishing. So uh, we can expect that there will still be like a lot of delay between be, be, before uh, the public authorities will take action. It was actually the same case with data protection. It's only in 2018 when GDPR was established in Europe. And I would say that it's still a joke how this is uh, executed. So it was supposed to be an effective way of um, protecting uh, users' data. But in fact, what it's um, led to is uh, just creating privacy and data 
uh, and GDPR policy websites. Uh, so every company uh, created a sub page in like introducing their policies and some uh, you know cookie policies, and that's it. That's that's all it. Um, that's all it did. There is no there is no effective um, execution of this policy. So I myself, I I've been active for like we've been active for four years. There was no control. There was no questions. Um, so GDPR is still more of a more of a like a law on paper, unfortunately. Then, uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, real protection for user data, and I, I, I presume the same might might happen with AI, unfortunately. Um, but like, the 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 problem is also that. Uh, like ChatGPT 3.5 and also ChatGPT 4. Um, so like I recently found a study that compared the responses for the same prompts by the both, both versions of the chat uh, from December last year and from June this year. And it seems that uh, it's changed the responses, which means that ChatGPT is kind of uh, being retrained using the new user's data which means that the user's data, data that are submitted uh, while prompting are probably used by, by OpenAI, but um, there is no cl clarity how and to what extent and whether they are protected or, or not. Uh, well, probably not if, uh, if they're indeed used to retrain the model. And uh, so uh, there is a, a lot of, um, there's lack of transparency in terms of how users' data uh, are, uh, are used by the uh, creators of LLM models. And also, yeah, um, that, that's one reason why, uh, especially large organizations have certain, um, are not willing, are not as, uh, as eager to, um, like the, the, they have to be extremely, extremely cautious how to incorporate uh, large uh, LLMs into their operations, and um, sometimes the 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 good uh, solution is to uh, build in-house LLMs. For instance, uh, using Langchain, that's a cheaper solution than train a model from scratch. Um, but obviously, not every organization uh, has resources and, and knows how to do it. So, I believe that's uh, yeah. That this is going to be a process. I think. In a, in a few years time, every large organization will have their own, their own models uh, internally. Actually, yeah. um, it's very interesting because my, I, am, I am attempting to push beyond the knowledge frontier, right? So a lot of the stuff that happens there is extremely sophisticated. It makes your head hurt sometimes when you read this stuff. You know, it's talking about the future, new ideas, all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, and talking sometimes about really scientific concepts, so how to do this or that or whatever. A normal person that's not an expert would just say, no, I, I'm, I don't want this. I want less of it. You just do thumbs down on the AI, which basically means that if anything that hurts a, a normal person's head will be downvoted in the AI, which would be used for training data, uh, which means that the AIs could potentially just get dumber and dumber, right? It's like, hey, we reverting to the mean year, and I'm actually seeing differences. If I use Chat GPT three, the GPT four with the eight K context window and the thirty two K context window are dramatically different. Even between the GPT four versions, the thirty two K version, which most people don't have access to, is much more creative and less influenced. So, and there are a bunch of other people that are also observing this. Is that basically the human interaction with the AIs are changing the behaviors. Plus, because there's so many legal issues for open AI and Anthropic at the moment, they're adding all sorts of layers on top of it. So actually, Claude, several people have reported now, and I've seen it too myself, that refuses to talk about certain topics. It just, mm -hmm. it just doesn't want to work on it. So, or the other thing that I see is a lot is delegation. Normally, the AI models would be perfectly willing to work on some hard problem with you, but now they start delegating. They say, oh, you need to talk to an expert if you really want to do this, right? Um, 
which is sort of like, hey, if AI is going to be a future, you know, I want the full power. I don't want to have the the half, you know, the the midwit or whatever you want to call it, right? So, and I think this is going to force a lot of companies just into bring AI in house to get the full power. Anyway, just right. comment on that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also presume that there will be like the most uh, shameless um, AI will be available on dark web somewhere <laughs> where, yeah, there will be probably a, like just black market for, for, uh, for, uh, for LLMs that are, yeah, extremely like um, uh, aggressive and like um, predatory on data. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, and uh, recently I, I'm, I'm based in EU, so I'm actually very much in touch with what is happening here in European Union. And EU, I think, is also nice to track because it's often a benchmark for the Euro for the American authorities, since we are in general historically more concerned about the data protection and um, and uh, and privacy here. Um, and the, it's we are more institutionalized, which is not always good for businesses. But in, on on 14th uh, June 2023, so just a few weeks ago, uh, European Union uh, established a comprehensive AI law uh, that is uh, called an EU AI Act. And what they claim on the website is that the purpose is to make sure that AI systems used in the EU are safe, transparent, traceable, non-discriminatory, and in environmentally friendly. Uh, AI systems should be overseen by people rather than by automation to prevent harmful outcomes. And this is um, indeed uh, uh, indeed uh, important. Uh, so we'll see how it pans out in reality, how this is executed, because it's easy to say, much harder to do. But like having that said, I'd like to proceed to the next question. So some of the dark sides of use, uh, using AI in organizations, like one of them being that AI does not have its own inherent uh, ethics. And this is indeed why it, it, it should be to some extent uh, a norm that AI is, is overseen by people. And the, the reason is that like we have our own like survival instinct that can tell us what to do, even if we are presented to an um, absolutely new situation, uh, because we have that uh, kind of uh, hardware and maybe software as well, that is inbuilt in our brains that tells us what to do in a, in a situation, even if we never encountered that situation before, but we are in danger that we know what like how to proceed, how to try to escape the situation. But AI does not have that like corpus. So AI's ethics fully depends on the person who programs AI. So that if there is a loophole, then AI will not be able to fill in that loophole. For instance, uh, just for a simple uh, example, you might say to AI, well, make my employees happy. And AI might actually come to a conclusion that what makes human happy the most is injecting heroin. So this is basically what uh, should be done as a policy to make employees happy. They should all get injected heroin. It's like like outrageous example, but what I mean is um, there is no such like the AI is not um, in the at least in the forum it is programmed right now. It has no means to judge the ethics of uh, using solutions that come out. So this is actually uh, one big problem. And that's also why um, I personally believe, like uh, referring to what was said before, I personally believe that it might be not the best idea to make a AI CEO, <laughs> but we'll see, like only um, future can tell. But I personally, I would still prefer to stay as a CEO and use AI as my advisors than vi vice versa. Um, so yeah, the next uh, dark side of, um, dark side of using AI in like large um, in institutions is well losing touch in human interaction and again this like loss in trust because uh, yeah every every uh, email can feel uh, bot bot like uh, these days and this is indeed uh, decreasing the motivation decreasing the engagement and also decreasing trust. Uh, and also being like judged and evaluated by AI is not as engaging and not as motivating as being, because at the end of the day, as humans, we, wanted to, we want to be 
appreciated by a human, not by a piece of code, which is already what's happening actually. So when we think about social media, what, what, what is happening on social media? We basically create content to be liked by uh, an algorithm, right? So we only get like viral if the like Twitter or X or a LinkedIn algorithm just, just like evaluates our content as worth promoting, right? So we already in a way are subject to the judgment of algorithms, but the, at the end of the day, especially in the workplace, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to be subject to, we, we don't want to feel like uh, lab rats and be subject to evaluation by machines. Uh, so that's 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 another. So the cultural, like organizational culture, and how it suffers from overuse of AI. That's another. That's another story. Um, and then what? What else? Of course, we have the increased amount of burnout this this year. I, I have to say, I even experienced that myself. So like when the chatbots came out in large amounts, I my first thought was like. The, what I was telling to uh, job seekers like one or two years ago might not be true today. What does my like? What is my work? What work even worth? If it might be out of date in a year or two from now because it's all changing so quickly. So why do I work at all? Like maybe I should just let things go, let things just happen naturally, and just uh, retire. <laughs> Or start gardening for a living. Maybe I sh maybe maybe there is no point anymore to do what what I was doing. So I had that, that dump in motivation myself, but I yeah put myself together. Uh, but I can see uh, that it's quite common. Like a lot of people feel down. They question their own role in the job market. They uh, they feel they are struggling. Like they are kind of competing against the force that is force of nature, although it's not, right? So like it's something that like a force that they cannot win against. And this is this is a um, relatively new situation. It's a, it's a singularity because uh, we are, this is the first time in the history we were like the technology that we created is, it can be effectively more intelligent than us in some aspects. And uh, one study I, I can cite here is uh, earlier this year, there was a study done by, let me see, I have it somewhere, oh yeah, by Professor Eke, no, by Professor Eka Roy Vainen, which is from, who is from Oulu University Hospital in Finland, and he, um, he tested uh, ChatGPT with uh, some battery of uh, tests for verbal IQ. So it was not just one test, it was like the whole battery. And uh, compared against a human cohort of 2,450 people, so a large, large population, what he found is, was that ChatGPT was, had a verbal IQ of 155, which is higher than 99.9% .9 of the test takers in that study. So that's basically, of course, um, the um, verbal IQ is not uh, synonymous to IQ. It's a different than like ability to make inference and ability to like um, to understand abstract concepts, etc., or to rationalize and to uh, uh, yeah think as we as we understand it. But uh, it's it's already a sign that in certain competencies. Uh, chat GPT can already exceed humans. Um, so this is this is the, the threat in a job market that is like uh, uh, that, that that is common and, and 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 for a good reason. So one open secret is that um, AI is already replacing jobs. And the reason why there is so much immersion in uh, in employment in uh, IT companies is, is because of AI. So yes, there was a recession, there is a recession. That's also why there were so many layoffs. But the reason why the employees are not uh, too often re-employed is because the like the previous employees were replaced by to large extent by AI, and that's that's and I can feel it on my own skin too. So instead of 
like finding more subcontractors for my own company, I, I basically taught how to use AI to the subcontractors I, I already had. So now everyone uses like a bunch of uh, AI tools and that's how we build the productivity, not by finding more people. So um, I, can, I, can, I can say this is definitely the case. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the fear is real. And historically, when we um, talk about the general impact of AI on the job market, then historically we are quite poor at predicting that. And uh, if you know the like recent history of the job market in the 60s and 70s, then together with the like first computers, there was a lot of speculation on how to how this would um, affect job market. And uh, just as an example, Professor Norbert Wiener from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, American mathematician philosopher um, who made contributions to the theory of automatic control, uh, wrote in, 20, in 1950, um, any labor which competes with slave labor must accept the economic conditions of slave labor, da da da. Oh, this is not the best uh, citation, I'm sorry. But uh, overall, uh, in 50s and 60s, all the labor leaders and uh, many of the uh, top mathematicians and economists, they were quite, uh, they, 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 um, uh, they were quite negative about the impact of technology on the job market. They basically, they were, uh, yeah, they were extremely anxious about it. And they were predicting that the job market is going to fall down soon. And even in the 70s, uh, there were, there were voices that uh, the, uh, the fate of accountants is doom, doomed because uh, accountants will be fully uh, replaced by computers. But what happened instead is that uh, accountants today are very well, like doing very well, just using uh, computers as their tools. So that also shows that sometimes the, sometimes the pessimism is not necessarily uh, justified and sometimes the, the reality is much, uh, much more colorful than uh, than the pessimistic uh, the scenarios. Although, as as said before, today, like the revolution we have today is is different in a sense that this is the first time when we actually have to do with something, some be some entity that might be in many ways more intelligent than human. That's why it's hard to um, hard to infer based on the historical like uh, historical events. It's hard to like uh, extrapolate. And um, it's too far-fetched to make the prediction that this time we'll experience the same surprise and the same, uh, yeah, uh, outburst of, uh, yeah, possibilities in the job market as, as, as historically we did. Um, and uh, one thing I have to say, I don't want, yeah, I already talked for a long time. So one thing I'd like to uh, finish with is my prediction, like, Again, it's no one can really predict how the job market uh, is going to shape to to be shaped. We are historically very bad at that, and I also don't know how it's going to work. But I can make some guesses. So one thing I'd like to show you is uh, like a figure I made. To oh, um, I'm disabled by the host to uh, screen sharing. So maybe Hannes might give me the access um. somehow. And uh, what I want to say is. It's so actually uh, the new highly mobile model of labor in which remote jobs and remote teams have become a norm. Uh, it basically, it, it leads to permanent changes in the structure of the job market. And, and there will be a change in organizational culture and which, um, in which an increased number of managers chooses the servant model of, of leadership. Um, so in this model, the leader is there to make the team members to, to help the team members, not to manage them. So to guide them and teach them. And if he's not there or she's not there to make uh, pivotal decisions or wipe the sluggish, but to, to just help the team. And uh, one prominent example of that type of leader is Jack Ma from Alibaba. Uh, so while in the past, the large organizations were strictly hierarchical, they now shift towards a cloud of small, cl closely collaborating teams taking the Natalia, yeah? I think you can share now, okay. should be possible. Okay. Still not. 
Um, I can also send you this picture by LinkedIn. Okay. Doesn't yeah, work. you've still got, it's still not, um, you haven't got, um, <laughs> as a letter that lives in Zoom, um, you haven't um, enabled other people to share out of the share thing. Yeah. It says security and said allow participants to share screen. Um, anyway. Yeah, it should, if you've, if you've okay, it should be. Um, but if you send me to LinkedIn, I can probably um, just bring that up. Just doing that. Okay. Um, sounds. So, uh, so my point of view is that since uh, we are observing corporate shift towards project-based work and delegating projects to subcontractors, um, then in the future, and the corporate structures might further dissolve into some form of decentralized autonomous organizations linked by knowledge makers. So now, so I, I like to show that picture actually that would- Actually, I'm thinking- oh, yeah. Yeah, so back, back in the day, we used to have like organizations were built in a way that we have a leader on top who is making all the pivotal decisions and delegating to managers and managers are managing like single, like the teams of uh, small teams of, of, of employees. And what I believe might happen in the close future is that like the managers would turn into more of a knowledge makers instead of decision makers that are um, managing smaller teams and not, not managing, but helping smaller teams. So this is a different, you can see that the arrows are inverted here. So the knowledge maker helps the team and it's not that how the team works on for the, for the, for the leader. And uh, in that model, um, AI is also helping everyone. So AI is not managing, but AI is a tool to, who serves everyone, who serves knowledge makers to make sense of things and who serves the, also these uh, small groups working together and taking decisions as a consensus in, in uh, building the solutions they are building. So this is, this is uh, a concept taken a little bit from uh, the Web3 uh, concept, but, uh, but it's already happening in the job market. So one good example of this process is uh, Meta, uh, former Facebook, and the way they are building their corporate structures is, is, is like this. So uh, the teams of uh, developers, they work together uh, in, in small teams and they are a bit, they, they, they are closed and they are, have a little bit of a startup culture. So working there doesn't differ much even though the like Meta is a huge corporation but working as a developer in, doesn't feel like working in a corporation. It feels more like a working in a startup. And every of these little teams has their stakeholders in the organization. So has uh, different parties to reach out to, to solve their problems and speed up the process. And so these are these knowledge makers that are the, you know, uh, waiting under the, under the phone and are ready to help. So uh, this, is, this is basically, and, uh, if you see, uh, if you uh, go to Glassdoor and uh, if you watch the recommendations and the reviews from the employees, you can see that Meta has very high, very, very high uh, employee satisfaction. There are thousands of reviews and uh, employees highly, highly uh, enjoy working for Meta. And that's one of the reasons why for the past 20 years, there were like not 20, 10 plus years, <laughs> there were, um, they were a profitable company. They had probably the highest net profits um, among these uh, big four of big five, like relatively. So um, th they are extremely good at making uh, employees happy. And this is one of the reasons because they understood they were the first ones who understood how the job market is changing. And also Facebook is also like Meta is also known for delegating. So they work with agencies, hiring subcontractors and in many countries, including Poland, most of the uh, developers working for Meta, they are not actually hired by Meta. They are hired by agencies like umbrella organizations that hire subcontractors and put them on projects in Meta. So that's exactly the, 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 the type of model that we have here. 
uh, and this is uh, this is the future in my opinion. So this is uh, probably going to be spread across the across the board in IT industry. Uh, and yeah, uh, I could talk for hours about how the job market is changing right now, but I think my time is over. So uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> If hey, Natalia, wants... thank you so much for uh, dropping in. I hope we'll have you again um, as a guest speaker. That'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we have an interesting future uh, coming to us. Um, one topic that uh, was on the agenda for this was actually uh, more specific in how to use data analysis um, or how to use. AI to do data analysis, you know, we're running really low on time. And this was Larry, and you know, unfortunately it's your topic. Um, but uh, I think what I would like to do is just give you a, a very high overview sort of what's happening. And, you know, Larry, it's really your section, but, um, and then maybe we could just um, potentially you know, do another meetup because I think it probably deserves an own topic here. So, so anyway, Larry, maybe you just want to introduce yourself um, so people know what you're doing and all the fantastic work you've done with personas and so on. Really amazing. I mean, this guy is a AI whisperer, you know, you know, it's, um, <laughs> the chat's disabled for some reason as well. Just, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you did that on purpose or chat. Yeah, the chat. The chat. I just noticed the chat box is disabled. Um, no, I did not do that on purpose at all. Um, might be. Uh, uh, just in case, um, because I see a few people have dropped out. Hey, I've got to go to bed because it's actually getting. It's three thirty in the morning, so um, I'll I'll come back and um, I well, do it's all to... being recorded, so you know. Yeah, you yeah. So I want to see Larry's. Like, I've, I've, I've turned up to see Larry's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry um, about that. Yeah, no, no that's right. No, but that's um good. All right, I'll see you guys later. Hey, Dan, just, I was going to say bye here. in the chat, but it's um it's yeah. locked in. But I'll, I'll I'll have a look at the recording again. So cool. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Go for it, Larry. Um, and so uh, basically I'm doing a PhD right now and uh, my uh, focus is primarily uh, what I call pedagogical prompting, uh, primarily for teachers. And uh, so I started writing these personas and uh, I think UDA, uh, Universal Data Analyst is one of the uh, most interesting personas I created. It does a lot of, um, things that I don't quite understand because I'm actually not uh, very good at um, statistical analysis. Um, so I've, I personally found it very useful in, in some of my own uh, uh, work, you know, uh, so. <laughs> uh, so uh, should I, should I uh, talk about the, some of the points on the, on the slide? Oh, I just threw it down there, you know, um, you can talk whatever you want. So tell us. What um, you're up to. So What's I that? think, um, again, I think it comes back to um, the uh, point that we talked about last time, which is um, that like, you, could, you can ask GPT to create whatever kind of persona, but um, there, there are some useful personas. Um, now, these useful personas are like these archetypal experts and they're experts in different areas. Um, so universal data uh, analyst is basically a persona for data um, analysis. But what's interesting about these personas is once they're super structured, uh, so first they're super structured. And once you load it to um, uh, chat GPT, it generates a very, very uh, focused perspective. Uh, now the perspective is so focused that uh, it forgets other perspectives. And here's here's a very interesting uh, example. Uh, when I posted Universal uh, Data Analyst, uh, one of the guys did uh, an analysis on the uh, uh, US, uh, I think, bank failure data. 
Now, he imported the data into uh, ChatGPT and uh, UDA doesn't recognize the data. So it kind of reads the data, but it doesn't understand what the data is. Now he has to copy the, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, explanations to uh, ChatGPT so that ChatGPT Chat understands. But what's interesting is if you simply load the data to ChatGPT, it actually understands what the data is. So what it means is that once uh, UDA is loaded into ChatGPT, it's so focused on that particular perspective that it doesn't cons uh, consider other perspectives. Now, uh, one of the things that can be done, um, well, I use these, like these personas are, um, like um, the religious um, <laughs> metaphor is basically God created uh, uh, human beings uh, out of his own image. So these are very archetypal and they're very structured and you can basically transform them into whoever uh, or whatever, um, with a simple prompt. So uh, two things that I do very often for uh, with these personas is I load ad hoc abilities. Um, like these are contextualized abilities, for example, UDA. Now, if I use it to analyze financial data, what I do is I ask it to generate all of the relevance of financial um, analytic abilities. And then it will generate the abilities following the, uh, the format and, and the conventions and load it, integrate it uh, to this persona, and then it will do its job um, uh, well. Another um, thing that I do is I, I, I transform the data. I, I transform the uh, persona so that we, um, we can actually have a team of experts. And, and this, um, uh, comes back to what Hans in, uh, introduced at the beginning of this session, which is that you can do all the brainstorming, evaluation, all kinds of things. Uh, I also have a team leader persona. Now, this is um, th this persona is actually quite good uh, to be loaded first, uh, because then you can use it to generate all the other uh, personas, all your teammates. So, um, uh, so the um, uh, you, you can use one persona to do the uh, COT. It will generate a plan, it will execute the plan, and it will explain the plan on the way um, following the uh, frameworks of um, um, uh, uh, you know, data analysis. Uh, or you can, you can actually use um, uh, the, the team leader to generate a, a team and then a workflow assigning these uh, different tasks to these different people so that it has more complexity. And um, so it can do all kinds of um, very interesting things uh, with, the, uh, with a very well-structured archetypal persona. Um, primarily, it's the perspective that uh, Hans has been, uh, uh, I think, that you've been talking about. And I actually don't quite, um, because I'm, I'm not in the uh, startup um, uh, industry, so I don't quite understand how it can be used in the industry, but um, I use it a lot in uh, education. I have um, a lot of different specialized personas for um, education. So that's pretty much how I use it. Uh, I like um, um, analyze, as, like, I don't know how accurate the analysis is because I don't have the expertise to do that, but the um, but because I load it into uh, code interpreter and most of the heavy work is done by Python uh, uh, codes generated at um, when the plan is ex executed. So I think it's pretty amazing. Hey Larry, I made a few slides just so people can see how it works. And I'll just go very quickly through it. So you load this prompt, it's a massive one. Might be the longest prompt ever, Larry, that you did, I think. Might not even fit into GPT-4 anymore. Um, extremely detailed. It detail. doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. No, it doesn't. The code interpreter. Yeah. 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 So then you load a data set. You, it just, it figures out what it is. And then you can just say, hey, create a plan to analyze it. You know, it creates a very, very extensive plan. It's quite amazing. It will take even a human a long time to do that. And then you just say start. It starts working. This is for electric vehicles. Then 
here is my prompt, do sensible things. <laughs> it figures out what to do. You know, it's it's just analyzing the data. You're doing some descriptive st statistics and stuff. Um, but then it starts trying to analyze things that, that it thinks might be sensible, right? Like I, I, I forgot all the details, you know, all sorts of stuff about electrical vehicles and so on. And then starts figuring out correlations and stuff like this and goes into all the really exotic areas, right? I mean, of course you can influence it, but it's sort of just interesting to see this thing is sort of on autopilot, right? It's prompting it can, itself. It, it, yeah, it can go very long. Actually, you can do this without um, loading uh, UDA in uh, code interpreter, but it doesn't doesn't do anything this long. Like this can be <laughs> like very very long automated process. Um, same question uh, and, uh, in uh, code interpreter, but it does like a very long thing, very deep, and then it generates like a lot of um, code and a lot of um, uh, graphs. So it's actually quite amazing um, to, to try it without uh, the initial prompt and with the initial prompt and to compare the results. So I think that's a very interesting point. So like most people see chat GPT with very short and simple prompts, right? And they expect it to behave in a certain way. And the experts are using, a, just see a completely different view because you know they use larger prompts they use self-prompting the prompts are highly structured to sort of activate a lot of knowledge inside um gpt's brain it's sort of like larry has figured out how to talk to the ai properly so that it really likes to do certain things right i think you once mentioned like talking to an alien right yeah um like um, the so normally what we take for granted we don't really uh, speak out and um, so it, it tends to be that when we get into a specific area we get into the task goals and uh, uh, I've been teaching the students um, uh, to do the prompts and he, here's a very specific task interpret this dream so you can you can have the primary data which is basically the dream and you can say interpret this dream. Now, the problem is this task itself doesn't provide any perspective. Uh, the like you, you can be like an ordinary person interpreting your own dream, or it can be a professional interpreting uh, like an, a psychoanalyst interpreting the dream, or it can be your your parents interpreting the dream. These are different perspectives. Now, without um, providing the without shaping the perspective, GPT doesn't know which perspective to take. So it gives you a relatively superficial um, answer. Um, like these are usually linguistically, these are high frequency word associations. So, uh, but once you load a particular perspective, it will drive GPT to go deeper in that partic particular perspective. Now, especially if you do the COT, uh, coupled with COT, it can go really deep. And also, if you do the brain simming thing with the uh, different experts in the uh, process, it goes really, really, really deep. And uh, my my uh, students have been having fun, having all kinds of conversation with the uh, GPT. Now, the problem with GPT-3 is that we found out that if you have like a few different personas and you try to play these, uh, assume these different roles, sometimes uh, GPT-3 uh, uh, can uh, you know, forget uh, exactly uh, what personas are there. But GPT-4 follows that, follows all of them very, very closely. You can actually assume one persona and do something, assume another persona, do something, do like different teamworks actually. So, um, so it's actually quite interesting. Yeah, one of the interesting things that I discovered is, it's like for me, everything is like, okay, you have this AI, you really want to go deep. Please don't be superficial, you know. Um, and uh, I have a friend, they're trying to do this crazy thing to design a cooktop that can, uh, essentially induction cooktop that can boil water in 15 seconds. Now it uses massive amounts of electricity, it uses like 15 kilowatts that you need to dump into the water in in 15 seconds. So I mean, this thing is just really hard to build. 
and there are lots of physical issues and constraints with this. And so I use this as a test case. Say, hey, okay, design this cooktop that can do this. Uh, and it's sort of like, even humans have a hard time figuring out what all the constraints are. And so it has to go deep because it's all about a contact problem. It's like, how do you create heat in contact with water, huge amount of water very quickly? And so there are lots of things you can do. Um, and so to force the AI to go really deep and solve this problem, you have to prompt it a lot. And it just doesn't want to go there, right? It's yeah. sort of like it's stuck into superficial things. It says, you know, use a whatever. So what I found worked was you take an idea generator. This is some of the KF push stuff that you do to create extremely technical and crazy ideas. Like, I don't know, use black holes to heat up the water. You know, it just, you can ask it to generate really crazy ideas. You create a very long text file with all of these crazy ideas that are sort of all over the map in physics. And you load it into chat GPT before you actually start asking it to work on this problem. And then what happens, because it sort of activates all this really crazy things, and this is essentially the attention model behind the AIs, you know, suddenly it sees black holes, quantum physics, blah, 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 it sees all these things. It sort of increases its IQ dramatically. And I think that's also what Larry's prompts does is, you know, it activates a lot of things in the brain of the AI through these attention models, and it suddenly becomes much more clever. And so the effect was, if I use this technique in Claude, it goes so deep that I get a headache. I mean, it goes really in, it's, it convinces me that you can actually build this thing using microfluidics or something or other, and does calculations how to actually do it. And I ask, I really, I, I'm, I'm just, my jaw just drops. I, I really have to ask questions. Is this truly possible? And this thing says, yes, it's possible. You just do it like this, right? Uh, it, it sort of begins, it, it just took me so far out of my normal experience that it was just sort of jaw dropping, talking to this thing that is just so sophisticated and thinking about physics and, and inventing stuff. And, and, and I really didn't know if the products it invented was could be real or not. It was totally plausible to me by just creating a context, right? A perspective, like the physicist's perspective, whatever. And I think that's partly also the reason why Larry's prompts work so well. He activates massive parts of, of what's going on in a very particular way, right? I don't know, Larry, if you have comments on that. It's been a few uh, weeks since we last talked, so, you know. Probably things have changed. Um, not, not not too much, but uh, I've been trying different short forms because the the prompts are too long. And um, but 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 the idea basically is, um, if you look at like there's a lot of persona uh, prompts uh, and on on Twitter on uh, uh, GitHub uh, now. But the the um, thing is that it you you have to have different layers. Uh, of ideas, and then you put them together. Somehow, GPT understands it, and using that, you can create new perspectives, a completely different perspectives. And then these perspectives can be put together to um, enhance the depth of the uh, uh, the conversation, whatever uh, task you're working on. And that depth cannot be reached by simply talking to GPT with one or two questions. So it's actually a, um, it uh, makes the, um, because we want to go deeper and deeper and deeper, we can have a very long conversation with GPT pushing it. Maybe we forget what we want to do, but now with the uh, initial prompts and these perspectives and some processes that uh, th this whole process is um, automated and uh, it's much more efficient. And uh, you can also, um, have your input during the process to change the directions. So, uh, so it's actually quite amazing. And also, uh, I've been using some of like you. You can ask um, 
for example, a mid journey to design anything, right? So, um, but in in the like, in the, I I don't quite understand design, but I think in the real world, the design follows uh, particular research methods, and so um, if you use like personas, designer personas to design things based on specific things, it will generate the designs more systematically. And then what's interesting is that if you, you if you you can generate a visual description and then you put it into Midjourney, the four pictures uh, Midjourney generates are quite similar. Like these are especially very good designs which means that I mean, Journey actually understands um, because it generates different versions, but this uh, this description is so accurate and vivid that it generates the four pictures very uh, uh, like very similar uh, pictures. So that's something also very interesting once you go very deep and once you go into very particular things. Hey guys, it's been a long meeting, but uh, our general rule is here. We don't stop until the last man drops. So I want to open it up to other conversations. You know, uh, we have some familiar faces. I just see CB coming up here again, the bottom of my list, or at the top of my list. Um, you know, if you feel like you have comments or there's some areas you want us to go into or things you've discovered now is sort of the open time to talk about it um the the main purpose of this group is to share information and and you know gather information from a professional standpoint of view how to use ai so uh if anyone wants to lead off with some questions or observations yeah, now's the time to talk and uh, we'll just keep on running until we run out of uh, enthusiasm here. So, but I want to first, I, before go, just thank you, Natalia. Thanks for your perspectives, Larry. Always super interesting talking to you. Been missing you in the last few weeks, you know. And of course, everyone else that shows up, um, you know, it's it's great to have a little community to share things with. So, anyways, the floor is open. So. I can see he wants to first, say just... something. I can see it in his face. Yeah, here. I've been <laughs> I've been trying to keep my mouth shut and and be a better listener. Um this was great. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia and, and Hans and, and Larry. Always insightful. I've been um I think a lot about the who what is the what is the right combination of skill set and expertise I need to get into a room to get to the optimal solution. Um, and what's been fascinating about Larry, you mentioned, you know, sometimes it's like going too deep or like having a hyper specialized role may actually do uh, more harm than good in certain scenarios, right? Like, how do you think about so it's like I'm out, I'm constantly trying to play around with like okay let's make this guy more generalized let's make this guy more specialized you know and like playing around with a few different combinations um, like is there I I I guess the general question is how do you guys think about um, who to get into the room like what is the right caliber of specialized versus generalized how many um, do you get it to come up with it like how do you guys think about solutioning around around that? Like, how do you get to the most optimal solution or outcome? Is that the question well, for you? I guess. Or, or just, I just, mean, I, it's an I, open question. I don't question. really yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, I've just sort of trusted ChatGPT to come up with personas, right? So I have a sort of standard ones and then it comes up with a bunch of other ones that it would find useful to solve the problem. But it hasn't been very, you know, very scientific. When I tried uh, the diplomatic, you know, the official way how to put a team together, it didn't work that well. But I don't, I didn't really experiment long enough. They were sort of too polite, you know. They were 
saying their own little bit, but not really interacting and pushing other people. So, um, which is actually interesting because I used to be in the research. And the first thing I learned there that it's sort of in research is that it's a very academic, right? It's a battleground of ideas. You're fighting for your idea. You shooting other people down saying, hey, this is not a good idea. Or you're praising them now and then, you know, when you feel like it. So it's a very different environment. But in that environment, in that academic environment, lots of the, the good ideas win. I mean, it's a scientific method, right? In in, biz, in business, it's sort of hard, right? It, you, you can't just tell your colleagues, like, listen, you're, you're on drugs or something here. We're never going to do that, right? You upset people, right? So... And so that's what I like with AI is I can really push them to the limit. And sometimes I feel like I'm really bad to the AI. I tell, I just tell them exactly what I think. And sometimes they behave better and I get better results than before, right? So I don't know if you discovered that too, that you're getting ruder and ruder to the AIs, right? So, <laughs> but I don't have an answer for you. Like how, how would you do it in a business setting? Right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same challenge with humans, right? It's like, the, like you said, Hans, the only the only benefit is I can swap out personas here and there. I can't just fire people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it is like it's it is it's different. And then it it also depends on the model. Like I I'm I'm using this tool now that I found from a guy with Twitter. Where, um, actually, I'd love to. Can I share with this with you guys? I've been using this more and more to just get what do all the other models output for the same question. Um, maybe I can show you guys really quickly. It could be something that's helpful. Can I share my screen? Um, I don't know. Let me see. I guess I have to stop my share and then allow other people to share. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best way. So can you uh, share now? Yeah, I got it. <clears throat> okay. So I, I find that... Um, you know, I'm using I'm using code interpreter for different reasons. I'm using Claude for different scenarios. I'm using, you know, Bard for different things. Um, they're all different. They're all good at different things. So, this guy created a um, a little menu bar icon that just pulls up everything. And then what's really cool is I can just type in the question here. You know, tell me about how AI will impact jobs. And it fills it into all the, they're essentially like web wrappers. Um, and I can see now how all the models would respond to that question, um, which is quite cool. And then what I can do is I can actually customize, you know, what do I want to run with, right? So these are the four I typically use. I use chat GPT, um, Bing, Perplexity, and uh, Llama 2, which is quite impressive. For an open source model um but but back, back to the initial question of like it's not just the roles now the the personas that larry's created behaves or responds differently depending on the model as well that you choose so now i'm like i'm like throwing it all at it and seeing hey what is the best answer that i get and i usually take bits and pieces of everything and come up with my own answer you know or, or a solution what is the name of this tool? So it's called um, uh, small. Hold on, let me. I'll share the link here. If I go to GitHub, there we go. Uh, menu bar, small small AI menu bar. It's a really, it's a really neat tool. Now there's stuff like nat.dev, but you need your own API keys for that. What's cool about these is it's just the web versions, but it's just presented really cool. And then you've got, you've got little shortcuts where if you want, let's say, I just want to use ChatGPT, you just go control one or control two or control three, and it's much easier to get to these or control A and you get, you know, all of them together. So I'm curious comparing these models, what are, what are sort of your impressions? Yeah, so um, anything anything writing related, my 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 gut is to go default to Claude Claude two. Um, I'm quite impressed with anything anything like yeah anything writing related. I go to Claude um, data anything anytime I'm analyzing data. Code interpreter is a no brainer. Um, I'm actually now playing around with 
So, so code and or chat GPT now has custom instructions. So I've been able to load, you know, give it a description of myself. Um, also a system prompt for how to behave. And you can see that it sort of starts to take on persona, like it just assigns itself personas, um, which has been really cool because this is now baked in as a system prompt. It doesn't lose context. It will forever remember it. So what's been cool is sometimes what I do is I play with, I take Larry's short form persona and I'll put it into the system prompt if I know I'm going to have really long conversations um, and I want that persona to stick. Did you sometimes find that the system prompt is sort of interfering with stuff? Because I found it. I do like, like it's because that it back to the whole special specialist versus generalist, right? Like if, if I, if I just want to talk to one role, like a therapist persona, cool. But if I'm problem solving, if I need multiple personas, if I need, you know, if I needed to take on different perspectives, yes, it becomes like, I got to keep going back in and changing it, you know, and creating new chats. So I found one where it's like, it's general enough. It kind of tells it, Hey, take on whatever role, um, don't talk, just do, you know, like that kind of language. It's also character restricted. So, you know, like I would love to load in IA in it, but IA is much yeah. more than 1500 characters. Um, yeah, which is why I like the short forms. And the short forms are great for Bing as well, because Bing also has a character limit of 4,000, which is more than, you know, 1500. But yeah, the, the small formats work well for certain scenarios. Um, back to your initial question, Hans. Perplexity to me has completely replaced Google. Whatever I would Google before, I now only use perplexity. So that's really? become my default search engine. Oh, yeah. It's like, I mean, I, it just, to me, it's just a better Google. It's like Google with your, you know, natural language capabilities. And then Llama 2, this one here is, is what I used to kind of, this is my, I, I swap in and out based on what I want to try out. Um, but Llama 2 has been really good too. I would say it's like on par with 3.5. Yeah. Um, coding, I've heard it's not good yet. Um, it's not as good as, you know, it's not anywhere close to, you know, GPT-4. But um, for writing tasks, it's as close. It's very close to 3.5, I would say. Have you played with a GPT with a 32K uh, window? No, I don't even know how to get. Is that only API? Or... Well, you can use Open Router to get access to it. And I've been okay. playing with it. It seems to be even at a much higher level. I don't know why. Maybe they didn't do much reinforcement learning on it. They didn't collaborate yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't collaborate yet. Um, no. I just keep on running more and more into situations where people are just upset with the companies because they sort of dumbing the stuff down, right? I don't know if you also feel like, okay, it used to be better, right? That type of thing. Maybe we're just getting used to stuff, but I don't know. No, I do. I absolutely notice it. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Like I just, yeah, I don't know what the, what, what that means, right? Like I, I feel like my, my theory earlier on was, <laughs> the idea is to get you hooked, or really get companies hooked. And then they're now incentivized to take, build their own versions, right? Um, which maybe gets to helping solve the, their problems a little bit better. Right. Uh, but I, I do find that like the general models are, are the publicly available free ones. It does get worse and worse i don't know if it's a it's me just getting used to it or yeah, yeah exactly yeah, you is, don't know uh, yeah yeah hey thanks for sharing i also want to give mark and laurie a uh, time to say something since you're hanging out here with us so let's get to know you a little bit better hey mark i think you might be on mute i can see <laughs> you there briefly yeah there you go there we go, much better. How's everybody? Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Uh, this has all been really, really fascinating. Um, seeing the way that you guys sort of differentiate 
the creation of the personas and the depth at which you guys have them going is really cool. Um, remember, I've sort of I've only been in this space and messing with development and things like that for I guess since maybe November of last year. Um, and one of the first things I did was create sort of a, an environment where I realized that if I convinced GPT to have simulations with it with itself, that 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 output was just drastically better. Um, I think the first experiment I did was with my mom, who was uh, works for um, National Health Institute, and they were doing a like cancer study on evaluating the carcinogenicity of a certain molecule. And I ran all of her coworkers, uh, LinkedIn's as personas and had them come together and they came up with the exact same updates to the studies and, and all the things. And it was, it was just fascinating. Uh, the one thing I really want to try looking at all of the, the, the IA stuff that we're working on is um, break out all of the different tools and sort of thought processes and, and, and experiments that we do inside of that prompting to be uh, more programmatic and actually sort of do it in code so that we can use it um, within ChatGPT, within any of these models and sort of run it alongside, especially now that we have function calling with the API so that we can take the personas and the different functions that it's calling and sort of remove the simulated aspect of it and turn it into an actual conversation, even though none of the, the people are real. So, you know, Dr. Innovator thinks that it's actually talking to a user, but that user is just another one of itself uh, or right. another you know, personality talking. And I, uh, I'm going to start breaking away from the plugin stuff that I'm working on to try to do that, because I think that could really augment any of the models that we're using to such a, a high degree, especially if we can, you know, get some benchmarks on on how all of these things change our outputs. Um, but this is all pretty cool. It's it's wild that we can do such a long form prompt and have the majority of it sort of follow through the conversations. And especially as we get more context window, that's going to be really cool. Um, but yeah, no, I, I appreciate being part of the group here and uh, really enjoy what we're doing and look forward to contributing a little bit with with maybe building something out like that. Uh, and if you guys are interested in what I'm doing, uh, you can check out uh, Recombinant AI on the plugin store. It's sort of what I use to build everything now. Used it to build itself, and now I'm trying to flesh it out to build whatever I want afterwards with it. But yeah, so thanks, guys. It's, it's, it's been cool to listen in. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to somebody plugging IA and all the personas from Larry into something else, right? Yeah. So new, it's going to be interesting. Sort of like a super IDE for. Uh, yeah, I'm players, trying to yeah. turn Chat GPT into a conversational IDE, essentially. Um, yeah. The first, I have it connected with GitHub right now, so it can sort of chat back and forth. And using some of the the things that we've talked about with uh, innovation algebra, I have done more, I think, with my plugin with just prompting than other people's approaches have by building you know, very complex backends with indexing and, you know, downloading the code, parsing through it. I just do it with ChatGPT and prompting and it, it kicks ass compared to <laughs> some other, yeah. other, other things. I really think exploring that natural language interaction is, is what's going to change the way that the, these things work. And uh, yeah, that's my, my next step is to put ChatGPT, uh, the GPT engineer program that recently came out and put that onto, um, Riplet so that it can get deployed and then hit that with an API and see if we can turn basically GPT into a conversation to create, you know, apps and code bases, with just a couple back and forth prompts. Uh, and I think, I think innovation algebra will definitely change the way that that works because it gives you, gives you a whole bunch of different files that you can edit to create pre prompts and, and system prompts and sort of steps as it goes along. Uh, as well as track all of your conversations and index them, which is what I really want to see uh, how smart these things can get with with history uh, over time. We'll, we'll see. So um, since we're in a smaller group now, I can also tell you that I spent some time improving innovation algebra in multiple ways. Um, I added more functions to it. Um, and stuff to reason beyond the knowledge frontier. Um, 
the prompt is now something like 25 kilobytes long, um, including a lot of stuff to develop policies, like regulations and things like this. Like, because to be honest, technology is not going to solve you solve all the problems in the world. It's probably going to be technology and policies, right? You know, we need to do things better as humans. And coming up with policies are very um, extremely tedious, right? It's like, what should my company do? You know, what's the policy on this on X on Y? What should a, a city do on, regarding something? So I started exploring and adding all that functions into it. So it has, it's sort of, it's IQ jumped a lot, but it's too, too big now to run inside GPT-4. So I didn't release it. And I don't have an easy, it runs in Claude essentially um, very well. And I'm happy to share that with sort of super hardcore users to see what reactions they have to this thing. So, um, so if you're interested, you know, reach out to me uh, for that. But Lori, you're still here. So something must be interesting. <laughs> tell, us what you, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about you and what oh, you found yeah. interesting. I, I just think um, we can never stop learning. And um, it, I'm definitely not an expert in this area. I just started working with chat GPT in May uh, and understanding a lot of this type of work. Um, and I just strongly believe that we have to learn this in order to keep up um, in the job market. Um, so it's just really interesting listening to you guys and what you have had to say. And I've really just been, you know, you guys have been giving a lot of food and I've been eating a lot of food, basically. <laughs> I appreciate well, it. Well, I hope you uh, come again to some of our uh, meetups and, you know, we get to know you better. I mean, um, a community becomes valuable when people are sharing and naturally interacting with each other, right? And right. helping each other along. And so this is, uh, and, you know, I think more professional communities around AI is actually very interesting. Um, you know, power users. Um, and I actually want to mention also to you guys uh, something called the AI exchange. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, are you a member, Sibi, of that? Um, I, I think, is this the one that, there's a Twitter Rachel that I follow. Yes, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. That's it. Rachel yeah. Woods or something. Yeah, she's a ex-Facebook meta person, yep. I think. I do. Yeah. That's where I know about. Yep. Um, and I, so, I think, it, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Hans. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think it's a newsletter, right? If I'm not mistaken. But there's a newsletter, and I think there might be a Slack or a Discord or something or other with 1,200 supposedly professionals behind it. So I'm curious. I haven't made the jump to subscribe to it, but I'm always looking for places where there are professionals hanging out together. Uh, and that sounded an interesting one, but I haven't really taken the, the leap yet. It, it's not expensive. It's like 100 bucks or something for a membership. But mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious if some people... I played around with that. Yeah. Or no I, I, other communities where, you yeah. know, you can find like-minded people. So. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't joined the, the hundred dollar per year subscription, but I know she adds a lot of really good, um, just good value content on Twitter. Are there groups that you are belonging to that you find valuable? Um, the one that I actually, like I, I, I think I actually learned about Larry's work through uh, through Brian Brian Romel's group. Oh, okay. Um, I forget what it's called now. Larry probably knows, but that I, I hop in there once in a while just to see what people are sharing and what folks have got cooking. Um, of course, IA. Uh, you know, I mean, I just enjoy being a part of this community here. Um, I'm trying to think of other Twitter, like Twitter, Twitter, Discord. Like the open AI channel, just looking at all the prompts, like looking at how what people are sharing. There's some really cool ones that people build in there. Um, but yeah, Twitter, Discord, Reddit. I would say those are those are the three places I try to keep tabs on this stuff. Is, is there a Reddit channel that's really interesting? Um, I like the. <clears throat> I find that I mean just. <laughs> I just I avoid now. I've actually unsubscribed from ChatGPT because it's now just a whole bunch of 
It's just, I don't find it very, a, a lot of value add stuff in there. There's one like ChatGPT Pro, which is good. There's a few specific like prompt engineering, like advanced prompt engineering dis or uh, subreddits, which are still quite good. Um, yeah, Singularity is always good just to see kind of like what's the latest <laughs> hype news in AI that people are running with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a few yeah, it's, subreddits. It's, it's, it's sort of surprising that it's sort of hard to find people that are, you know, specializing on super business prompts, right? It's like, it's mostly, I, I guess Larry also look at the prompts and think, wow, this is a bunch of amateur nonsense, right? They don't know what they're doing, right? <laughs> and then there are folks that are sort of wielding the weapons here. It's like, yeah, you yeah. have the nuclear bombs to, to, yeah. to blow up the world, right? Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can do crazy stuff with some of these prompts, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah that, it, that gap between I think like power users and and everyday ones is is massive. Yeah, you know, it's something I didn't really notice when I was first playing with it because I kind of thought everybody was getting super deep into cognitive structures of how this thing would talk back and forth. My, my inner AI nerd from when I was a kid would <laughs> would come out, and I. I but the way that some people sort of just expect it to give you every piece of it without having to manipulate it is, is pretty wild in some of the forums I'm on, yeah. Yeah. I, I do find that there was a really good article that Ethan Mollick put out, I think back in June, and it was called Detecting the Secret Cyborgs in Your Organization. Um, and I find that like that rings really, really true. And essentially what it got to was you do have soup like power users in your organization, but there is no incentive for them to put up their hands and tell you <laughs> that they're power users, right? Because if you think about it, in an organization, <laughs> like what's the incentive? Like this thing is it's a general purpose technology. We all have access to the best models out there. You know, it's not like previous pieces of technology where you know, companies, what do we do? Like we centralize it, we pick and choose who gets access to what, you know, there's, it's just like everybody has access to all of it. And then people are figuring out better and better ways to automate parts of their jobs. But then what is the incentive for them to tell their boss? Hey, this is how I'm using it. There is none, right? Like who is the rewards going to? They might just get more work ultimately. So- right. I do find that, you know, I struggle with like, I, it's like pulling teeth sometimes. I'm like, I know there's superstars in my org. Um, and like, I have to, yeah, it's like, how do I get them sharing more? They're probably kind of lurking around just like I am right in here in these groups and, you know, in Discord channels, but there's no incentive for them at work to be like, here's, I'm now doing my eight hours of work in four hours. They'd much rather build a side hustle you know, spend time with family, do other things and be like, look how I'm being more productive at work. <laughs> right. So I do find that it, it rings true, um, at least in corporate settings, in my experience. So uh, actually following up on that, Larry, uh, you used to be publishing a lot of prompts, right? And you took a lot of them down, right? Um, and what do you, have you thought a little bit about the future of all these really deep prompts and what do you want to do with them? Um, how to handle all the ethical issues of all the people you might put out of a job because these prompts are just getting so good. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, what, 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 what of the prompts I, I uh, um, deleted from the uh, repository is uh, uh, UST, the universal storyteller, because um I use that prompt on a lot of uh, student essays, basically, uh, you know, because I have access to, like my students gave me access to um, uh, questions and, and, and also um, like, these are very specific questions. You have to read something and then um, write in response. And these are all social science and humanities uh, writing assignments. Um, now, the first thing is, uh, you know, I have to say that CB, the, uh, if uh, in, for um, social science and um, humanities, especially writing uh, like uh, language intensive uh, tasks, I find 
and chat GPT much better in quality than uh, Claude. Claude is very uh, straightforward. It doesn't really generate a lot of uh, interesting language. But, but I, so I started using that on a lot of those articles and I, and, and I also test them on Turnitin. I, because I'm doing PhD, I have access to uh, Turnitin. And it really is fascinating you know, to see, like, they really, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't think they have any plan right now for what's happening, because, like, most of my students are, like, they're, like, everyone is using them, but most of my students' classmates are using them in very simple ways, probably Molly ways, you know, like, just say something, add something, you know, so the articles generated tend to be very generic. Um, they don't go into depth. Um, relatively easy for the for the tutor to uh, to to see. But once I started using UST on on some of the stuff, especially like you can incorporate new abilities. So I the first thing I do is to ask UST to incorporate uh, academic writing abilities, right? And then it generates all these academic writing stuff, and and then it starts to like go deeper and deeper and it's just amazing. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that a smart students once finding out, you know, a problem like that would be immediately start using that to, to work out all of the essays. And in fact, I did some of the essays and, uh, you know, for testing and it takes about five minutes to generate an article, like a really good one. Uh, like these are usually 500 to a thousand uh, words articles. Um, so, and, and these are not like uh, like generic, superficial kind of thing. These are very deep stuff. So, I feel like I don't know. I mean, like this is going to happen, but I don't think the academia is prepared for this. Like my like, especially uh, probably in third world countries, uh, in Thailand, for example. But I think a lot of them are starting to think about it in, uh, in China, probably. But um, it's it's a huge problem, I would say. At least on in, in my area, it's a huge problem. And my uh, my wife is an English teacher. Um, she did like high school English, and she actually just got out of the classroom this year to do teacher mentorship. And all of her teachers that she's helping have students right who, who are starting to turn in work that's very clearly outside of their their abilities, and is very clearly done with ChatGPT and sort of her suggestion to all of them was, you know, she was a little, <laughs> a little, uh, a little uh, school hard knocks where she said, you know, if you don't know your students well enough to know if they're using an AI to write their essays, then you don't pay attention. But when it comes to that high academia level, it's like, yeah, of course, these people have the ability to do these things. It's just, you know, do they take the time and the effort to write it all out? I, uh, I, I always wonder, we've talked about it a bunch is like, will academia, will education move towards more of sort of oration and, and spoken rhetoric of, yeah, you can do all this research, but if you can't stand up in front of the class and present it, or if you can't, you know, give a presentation or, or, or a speech on something that it's, you haven't synthesized it. And so, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. I also had some eye-opening things. Um, so, I started using different systems together. For example, I would use um, this KF push stuff to generate ideas. For example, I would ask it something like, can you use combined psychology and smart cities and come up with new ideas how to make inhabitants less stressed, less stressed right? So it's sort of like combining different ideas together. And then it comes up with really interesting things using psychological phenomena that I never even knew existed. But it comes up, it sort of reasons across different fields where a lot of innovation happens. And then what I do is I take those ideas and essentially run it through the storyteller to come up with novel predictions of the future and novel stories. Now, I think the 
a, a good sign for me, at least from a science fiction story point of view, it's like, you know, there are surprises in the story. You know, say, so, oh, I didn't really think about that. And normally when you read a story, that makes the story interesting. It's like, oh, okay, that's sort of, and let's keep on happening in the interesting stories, right? And now suddenly you have this thing that generates really high quality ideas, puts it together, and it sort of starts looking like a, a science fiction book to me. I read a lot of science fiction. And I think the creative industry, you know, everyone that's in Hollywood or whatever, they sort of think that they are safe, you know, with coming up with plots and things like this. But in reality, they're probably the easiest to disrupt in the future, right? The stories will be just better than the best story out there, right? And I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you also see that, Larry, with your students, the stories become more interesting, right? They, you, you feel like they get into a point as where it's like going beyond what a human would write. I mean, uh, I mean like, like the student that I'm teaching is a um, very smart uh, student uh, studying in uh, like one of the top universities in North America. And um, he, he has this moral, um, uh, let's say a uh, persistence not to use GPT actually. All his classmates used a GPT last semester. Uh, and uh, I, I told him, uh, you know, like you're in year one, you, you need to develop your abilities and don't use GPT, really learn stuff. And he actually uh, stuck to that. Um, and what's interesting is um, he, well, he, he ended up at, at uh, you know, top 20% of his class actually. So he's pretty good. So I think, and then I started teaching him how to use GPT in a very sophisticated way. And also he started to, uh, uh, you know, understand, it, like he found out a lot of the things that I um, spent a lot of time figuring out, but obviously, you know, there's already the scaffolding and stuff uh, himself. And he wrote a lot of interesting stuff, you know, the conversations and the, uh, the, the procedures. So I think, um, the, the, uh, the, we're looking at a generation that once they discover how to use it sophisticatedly, they will. It's not like, like, so I think the problem right now is they don't know how to use it sophisticatedly. They go online, you know, on Twitter, there's no way that they can figure out how to use it. But once they truly understand how to use it, they're going to use it and there's no way any um, tool so far that we have can detect uh, the results of their writing assignments, at least, you know. So it, education has to change fundamentally, like the, the way that is conducted. Like uh, in North America, they outsource, um, like they have these huge classes, like 250 uh, student classes, right? It's impossible for like the, uh, and then they outsource the, um, uh, evaluation to TAs. It's just impossible for them to know every student in person. So I think, uh, if, if, if I, I don't know, like, I feel like, you know, personalized education, the era of personalized education has come in a way. So I feel like liberal arts education, small classes discuss, you know, uh, uh, a discussion based, a seminar classes might be more interesting, you know, for, 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 um, yeah, because my perspective it, is more around, you know, I mean, it, it clearly education is in trouble, but I think also jobs are really in, in trouble too, in some weird way, in the sense that suddenly you used to pay people to come up with ideas like, hey, you know, come and they go away and they say, are we going to do this in business? And, you know, most of the time it dies off, right? It's sort of some initiatives, a lot of initiatives just don't pan out, but somebody was paid to come up with this thing. We're going to do X. We're going to, you know, create a blog or whatever, right? So people come up with these ideas and that sort of just, if you're in upper management, that's expectation. And, you know, you have to be creative and think about this stuff. But now I'm at a point where I just say, it's not even worth thinking about an idea because the AI can generate so many ideas and evaluate those ideas 
so fast on any criteria I want, including future ideas that I never even could imagine in areas that I don't even work in. And so I was actually just in a creativity class um, yesterday evening. And there was a lot of, you know, the old school thing is like, you know, a human is going to come up with ideas and we're going to argue about it. And there's no research involved. But and then the question is just to this these group of people. It's like, well, how do you know if somebody else has a better idea than yours? Why, why wouldn't you use GPT or something to find the research, create a thousand ideas, evaluate them? And then from a business perspective, you just pick the ones, right? That's interesting. So my, in my future world, I think ideas are free. Anyone can will be able to do them. And, and, and now the only problem is that suddenly you wake up and every day you have 100 really good ideas, all ranked in criteria. And there's five or 10 at the top, which the, the CEO looks at and it's like, yes, we could probably do this right? But we need people with agency to actually do those things, yes. right? Ideas are free, but we still need to execute it. And, and it's sort of tragic. I mean, I've worked on, for example, idea, rapid idea creation to improve water quality in Africa, right? It comes up with incredible ideas that I look and say, yeah, these are interesting policies or technologies or whatever you can use. But still, we need the humans to actually decide what to do it. And I imagine a traditional upper management that doesn't, are not used to getting 10 ideas per day that are really good. They have to pick, they have to decide, they have to do something to run the, and they might even say, like, listen, it's not your job to come up with these ideas. And you say, well, I didn't even do it, it's AI I did it, right? So. And, and these ideas are going to be of higher quality. For, uh, like um, my student started, uh, like he tested out an uh, idea basically, which is dream interpretation, because I have this uh, psychoanalyst, one of the earliest versions. And thing is, in in the real world, you go to see the psychology, uh, you know, the psychoanalyst yourself. But but if you think about this question, it's much better that if the psychoanalyst actually talks to the mother. Right, talks to the to the parents, talks to the friends, but in reality, you can't do all of those things. But the secondary data, uh, se secondary data based on the dream and also these uh, simulations can actually provide that opportunity for this virtual psychoanalyst to talk to these people, right? Uh, the you know the parents and the friends uh, to generate a better understanding of uh, you know his psychological state. So uh, I think. Um, the the I think we're also looking at a um, new uh, working modes. You know the, this great uh, connectivity uh, uh, unachievable in reality due to all kinds of reasons, primarily resource uh, like uh, uh, you know, um, and and also something interesting. I I um, be, because um, uh, GPT is truly multilingual. So I showed IA to a friend of mine in Beijing. Uh, he's Chinese, and then he tested out because he wanted to. He was thinking about open opening this um, hot, like uh, high end luxury goods chain or something. So he's uh, tested out IA on on uh, he, his ideas. Um, he doesn't know how to use IA uh, if, uh, effectively, obviously, because there's a lot of uh, learning and stuff. So he just tested it out, and he was very very impressed. He's a professional. He's been in. Uh, marketing for uh, uh, and, and brand management for um, 20 years, 30 years now. So he's he's very impressed. And the uh, I mean, like, obviously, the way that he operates IA uh, creates results that lack depth. But but it's like it's already really good. And he only used it on uh, a GPT 3.5. So I'm saying like, I, like the like once these people find out to actually, uh, how to use GPT more efficiently, everything is going to change. And uh, this comes back, I think, to see these um, uh, comment about you know these uh, superhuman beings in the companies, right? <laughs> like they they don't have uh, incentive to talk to the to the boss about it. But um, I think eventually every everyone is going to learn how to use it in a more uh, effective way. And and then um, 
once a lot of people start to use it and everything is going to change, I think. Agree. Yeah. So, can I so one can of I the share with you guys. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Hans. Go ahead. Go ahead, Siri. No, course, I mean, if ahead. I wanted to show you guys, I would love to um, maybe even like if we can make like just cool because there's so many tools that are coming out um, that I'm always trying. Uh, I'd love to maybe share next time, just like hey, here are the new things that have been working. Um, one other one I wanted to share with you guys today was uh, CB. Just on that yeah, point, before yeah. we continue, sure. I would love to have you as a guest to awesome. speak about your experience on yeah. on one of the meetups, so we can figure out how to do that. Fantastic, yeah. Like I, I think I just love like, to share just different tools yeah, that I've been yeah. trying out and what's working. Awesome, yeah. Um, so rewind.ai. I don't know if you guys have played around with this thing. Yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's so good. It's a little creepy. Um, essentially what it does is here, let me, let me share my screen. And they actually just came out with an iOS app, but what it is, is where's my rewind. So if I go to search rewind, um, it tracks, it records every single thing that is happening on your screens. Um, this meeting right now is being transcribed in real time. Um, and it's capturing everything that's going into my mic. It's capturing everything that I'm hearing. Um, and what's really cool about this is it has fundamentally changed how I, um, how I engage in meetings. And I'll tell you why, like back to kind of my ADHD brain, because I don't, because I don't want to forget things, the way usually I'm in meetings is I'm always taking notes. I'm constantly writing stuff down, which prevents me from really like paying attention, right? So what's been cool about this tool is I no longer take notes. And the reason why is because I can at any point, am I still sharing my screen? Yeah, we can see. So I go to search rewind and then I can just at any point, um, go to uh go to go to like a previous meeting um why is this not showing up see like it's it's recording it's technically recording the meeting right now right <laughs> so so right now it's saying the transcriptions in progress because it recognizes that the meeting is in progress but if i go to like a a, a previous meeting maybe um I want to make sure I don't pull up anything, anything too sensitive here, but let's say I go down in here. It also has all your chat GPT sessions and all that stuff too, right? It, it's tracking everything that's showing up on the screen. So what's cool about it is. Does it do multiple screens too? Uh, no, right now it's only doing one screen. Okay, but it's, it's and and this is only on the the new Macs, right? The new ARM based Macs, not as not the 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 Intel based ones, right? I, I'm not actually I'm not too sure. Um, I think that's what I looked at because I was right, also yeah. intrigued by this thing, right? So yeah, I'm trying like I'm usually there's a usually when I click on it, it brings up the screen where I'm able to go and search all. Oh, maybe this this too. Yeah, there we go. There it is. So now if I just go to meetings. It'll tell me, hey, here's all the meetings that you've had today, right? So, okay, boom. You know, this was a call that I had earlier. Uh, what's really cool is not only does it do, it gives me the transcripts, it now sends that you have to opt in, but it sends the transcript directly to GPT and it spits out a meeting summary. I'm no longer taking notes. I'm no longer sitting and here's what I got to do. Um it's just saying, here's what you talked about. And what's really cool is you connect it to your Google, your Gmail, and it pulls up a new email, CCs the, includes the participants who attended that meeting, puts the meeting transcript right in there. <laughs> and it's just fundamentally transformed how I you know work. Now, I will say the meeting recaps aren't amazing. So what I do do is I go to the transcript. I just copy this transcript. I have a prompt that gives me a much thorough, much better meeting recap. I go to Claude because I can be on two hour calls. Claude will take in the whole, the whole damn thing. 
just dump the entire transcript, put in my prompt that says, spit me out in this format, right? Discussion points, action items, next steps, resources, um, and boom, done. And it's just completely changed my workflow. So this, this tool has been really, really cool. It's sort of one of those things. It's sort of like the Excel moment. It's like, I want that. I'll probably go buy a new Mac, you know, just to get that. But they so damn expensive, right? So, but anyway, I think it only works on the new. I don't I, know some, yeah. You know. I'll I'll check that, Hans. I I'm not I'm not sure. And and so they've just recently launched an iOS app too. So, but it only tracks Safari. But I I think this is the future. Like this is where this is going, right? Like it's. Like, what are we using our brains for? Is it to store stuff? Like, we're essentially offloading that storage layer in addition to now the compute layer of our brains to this thing, <laughs> you know? And we take care of what's left, <laughs> which is, I guess, I don't I know mean, what it is. Like, you know what so I mean? Actually, I thought a lot about this. Okay. Yeah. So, you can now search the past, right? And get really, you can look in the past and find and have anything summarized you want, right? A research, whatever, right? Now we have, or soon we'll have, and we see that with IA and brain simming and all this stuff and all the personas, we can sort of peer in the future, right? So we can even come up with new ideas and change how our business runs and so on. And we can generate tons of really good ideas how to improve your business. We know that we can automate a lot of stuff when it comes to social media and communicating with other users. Um, the touch point, of course, is still, you know, you're touching with users and they don't, or other humans, and they don't normally behave in the way you expect, right? They do all their own thing, right? So, so you can't convert, even if you have, a million ideas that are really good you can't convince people to actually do any of them right you still have this intrinsic thing that you need to convince humans to do it maybe some of them could be convinced by ai but you probably will need people to convince other people to work on some problems and so on right so um but uh, you can imagine in i uh AI encroaching slowly more and more on these things. And like CB said, what's left is maybe just intuition, right? There's 20 ideas in your play today. You as a CEO or a director need to pick intuitively which ones you think they're already all pretty good, but you think, oh, okay, this is gonna work better than that. Yeah. And the only thing that is still left is you need to maybe delegate it to somebody to do it. Or maybe that will be done in the future by AI too, right? Yeah. And so they truly might not be anything left for us when it comes to creativity, ideation, inventing things, maybe just the interhuman things. But, you know, I see more and more tools that actually totally automate talking to humans, right? I mean, like social media is essentially trying to talk to humans, but you don't have the patience to do it every day. So AI is much better. They they are. I actually just saw it. There's a some guy, the AI uh, channel called AI Solopreneur, right? Very popular. Lots of you might a lot of people subscribe to it. Turns out that whole channel is run by an AI. Everything. We always thought it was a human, but it's actually an AI that did it. He went from it's like zero to over a hundred thousand followers in like a year and a half using just this AI system. It's crazy. <laughs> he just published it <laughs> that he's doing it. I tried to actually talk to the guy because I thought it's a real human, right? So the, is it is it this channel? This yeah, the one that yeah, I yeah on this guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this whole yeah. thing is 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 just AI generated? As far as I can tell. What? see he's trying to sell his course now so you can actually yeah for i don't know 147 dollars you can learn how he did it <laughs> that's crazy i had no idea that's amazing 
And yeah. he says, you know, the only difference is I figured out how to make it sound like a human. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be so fascinating. I really like um, <clears throat> the way. So, OK, so great storage, compute gone. I think what's left is, you know, Hans, to your point, it's like what makes us truly human? Like what is our competitive advantage as humans? <laughs> you know, like it is it the is it the empathy like is it like what that's what i'm focusing on now which is i think it's a good conversation to have i think for a very long time we've been you know we've we've thought our value add as a human is to do this stuff right to be intelligent to problem solve to do all of these things okay so if we offload all of these things to this maybe now it's time to actually focus on what the hell is it that you know truly makes us humans and maybe we should it's time to prioritize that you know instead of i gotta make money to pay my friend my mortgage and all of this stuff i i think it's a good thing i think it, it's going to help us maybe potentially evolve in ways that we haven't been able to in the past i don't know i see we have a new guest that just joined dropped in Lishesh, maybe you want to say hello yeah hi Hello. So <laughs> it's a it, it's a really interesting conversation. So we're just listening. Yeah. Hi. So maybe one thing that makes us human is we die. So this experience we die. <laughs> that that you have been born and you will die one day. And um so like as you said, like we have to pay rent and this and that and all. So it's it's kind of this identity that we live up until we die, and and I think that is what makes us humans. Like we identify ourselves from our past memories and experiences throughout the life, and that makes us a, a persona, and that we carry on through our, our throughout our entire lives. So maybe this thing. So yeah. uh, I'm curious, tell us a little bit about yourself. What brings you here? Did, were you meet on the meetup earlier and just dropped off and came back or are you just dropping in? So I'm dropping in for the first time. So I just checked out this uh, page for brain simming and it, it was like a really interesting topic. <laughs> so I I I jumped in the, in the call, but uh, uh, I, I really didn't know what to expect. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, but, so the meeting started, you know, two or three hours ago. Uh, okay. We have a policy here that we don't stop until everyone is tired. Uh, so, it but it is fun. all being recorded, so you can actually. There's the official part that happened. I don't know, two and a half hours ago, <laughs> something you want okay. three hours okay. nearly ago. So, um, so you can catch that uh, when once I publish it. Yeah. No worries. It's it's uh, anyways. It's cool. So uh, I'll tell uh, something. Uh, like I introduce myself. So my name is Vishesh. I'm presently residing in Bangalore, India. So, and um, I, I'm a CTO of a company called Bond Geek. And uh, it's a very fintech platform where we are trying to uh, uh, save, uh, sell bonds as savings instrument for anyone who is keeping money in bank for uh, gaining interest and for saving purposes. And uh, on the side 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 uh, projects, I keep doing experimenting with AI. So like you so showed this solo and entrepreneur channel on Twitter. So uh, I also built some bots on Twitter, which just uses OpenAI and so OpenAI to summarize and post things. So basically a channel called Binary Briefs on Twitter. Thanks. So yeah, so so basically, just a, very very interested in AI and what's happening all around. So that that brings me in. So how did the channel work out for you? Did you find humans interacted with the uh, AI or not? Yeah, yeah. Some uh, so until we announced it that it's a it's a bot. So people were messaging us that hey, can we connect with you? Did this some of the posts are like really cool and all. So. So, but we like ultimately had to say, okay, we are bought. So don't, don't ping us. Like, so how many founders, how many followers did you get in this way? 
so uh, so not much uh, honestly so we went up to around 150 followers but seems like they were also bots <laughs> after some time <laughs> it dropped down to around uh, 80 70 or 80 followers yeah but it was one of the because, experiment yeah uh, it's uh, i mean twitter is an interesting you know if you have low number of users and then suddenly there's this is this young girl that starts following you, right? It's just weird. It's like, okay, w w how does it even work? Right? I don't tweet that much. And now I have all these, at one point there were a lot of Chinese girls following me. I don't know if it's Larry, because you introduced, <laughs> I, I just I just don't get it. It's just very weird. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me at all. So. In in our case, a lot of Japanese people were following us. Like a lot and lot of Japanese people. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Vihesh, how, how did you find um just how did you find Brain Sim the, the the webpage? Like how did you find the group? How did you find us? Oh, cool. So I was just uh, roaming around in Twitter and I saw this uh, company Runway Runway Labs. So they are like building a complete generative AI studio. So I was just scrolling through their feed and then uh, this um, page came up somewhere like this AI meetup happens some in US every, every weekend or so. So I just thought, okay, maybe I just check out. And from there, I went to this page. There I saw, okay, there are three, four events happening. One is happening today. So I was a little confused between time zone. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll just join anyways. <laughs> Let's see. Cool. So it's a long thread that I have to, that I hopped. Well, it. we're yeah. happy to have you and hope you come again. So basically every two weeks, we typically share stuff that professionals are interested in. So there's lots of uh, prompts and stuff. Everyone here is pretty much super heavy user, uh, way beyond just three line prompts. So we measure our prompts in kilobytes at this point. So, <laughs> uh, and so it's very deep stuff. A lot of work on personas, uh, self prompting. So basically a system that prompt itself um a lot of business applications and pretty heavy users of of in innovation algebra and um now hopefully also brain simming for solving real business problems so um right. pretty deep stuff yeah so it's not yeah. true so i was looking for something deep like this but my mathematics is like very behind me so so also like really really maybe lucky to find this today cool. yeah, yeah so you don't actually need to know much because a lot of it gets outsourced now to ais that are actually just doing all the stuff um if you're interested in data analysis you should definitely speak to larry um uh that's doing more has some personas and stuff like this so and, and you know i'll also post links and stuff like this to all the relevant pages once the meeting is done so yeah awesome. good Thank yeah it's a quite it's a quite diverse group which i love um there's i mean larry who's got a linguistic background there's business people um natalia i think she mentioned she's she's a neuroscientist who's turned into like a career business coach so lots of diverse backgrounds yeah yeah, it's interesting. So um, I overlap with several communities um, in Silicon Valley. And so also some people that show up are old friends and people from the Acker Dojo and so on. Um, I mean, it, it's just an interesting time to be in Silicon Valley because a lot of things are happening and there's so many events and it's sort of hard to find people that are really seriously using AI in business. It's sort of like the business world hasn't, totally woken up yet right it's just people are putting their foot in and trying things but uh you know i guess a lot of people that are here realize that this is totally going to change the game completely and a lot of people are way behind the curve right uh, yeah. and, and you know people that show up here tend to want to be above 
in front of everyone else on the curve. So, um, so the yeah. group is interesting in that way. So, I don't know, CB, if I sort of butchered my. I mean, I, I'm not in a corporate setting anymore. Thank God. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, th I, th I think you're on point. I think that's my observation as well. Like I've, I've, um, it, I mean, the, the way I see it, there's like, there's two, there's the productivity angle, there's the productivity benefits or impact of leveraging AI in everybody's day to day. And then there's the commercial impact, right? So, and, and there's overlap there, but I do find that again, because this is a general purpose technology, everybody's got access to it. Um, you know, people are figuring out ways to make their own lives productive, not a lot of incentive to share that upwards, right? So that's one angle. The commercial side of things is taking a while. Like I, I there are companies, you know, that have, that have been fast to kind of put things out, um, you know, like chatbot on my website or, you know, like, and a lot of the analytics platforms have integrated, you know, GPT capabilities in it. Um, but I think the biggest risk, at least for us, like I run, a, I manage a services business. So at least for us, it's, it's customer data. There's so much privacy concerns. There's so much, um, that's, that's the biggest roadblock is, is getting over that. Um, but then I think it's a matter of time once we're over that, because it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, like, if we're not able to do that, then we're just, whoever, we're going to get a competitor that's AI enabled from the ground up. That's got all the stuff baked into the contracts. Customers are going to migrate to them. They're going to get better value out of it. Like it's this weird, we're like, do we stop? Do we go? It's just a weird time right now. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So like one, there, one there, question. Like, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Right. Okay, cool. So uh, you talked about people putting chatbots in, uh, in their website. So I see a lot of things around like summarization bots, chatbots, like Chrome extensions, people are also charging sub like subscription for it. So like, like there are uh, companies who have started capitalizing on the commercial side of GPT. But the point that you made around data privacy and things. So uh like with uh, embeddings like i i used recently embeddings in chat gpt to just be able to attach a knowledge base around my specific data but i didn't have to um like i figured out a way that the data remains in the client's infrastructure like it never leaves that infrastructure like we can deploy that like getting the embedded vectors in, and storing that into some database that resides in the client's infrastructure. So do you think something of that sort would be able to address this issue of privacy? It, it could, but ultimately, if you're still like, are you still not exposing the data to, like if you're using the APIs, right? To like the GPT-4 or whatever you're using, are you mm -hmm. still not exposing the data to, to their servers, like to API, to GP or open AI? In that sense, I have to, because right now I'm using open AI, but in their contract, they say that they don't use the data sent over API calls for, uh, for their purposes. But I guess in that case, in that, 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 in that case we can use a model like Llama, uh, which runs specifically in client infrastructure. Correct. That, and that's what I mean by like, it's just a matter of time. Right, because once these open source models get as good, um, then right, everybody's going to be doing just that. Right now, yeah, yeah, OpenAI is saying, hey, they're not going to use it to train their models. But from my experience with talking to customers, is they don't trust that. <laughs> like <laughs> at least not yet, you know. So, so you can I, actually, if you want to just create embeddings, there are better models to use than OpenAI models that are much mm -hmm. cheaper to run and actually have better results um that are open source um and you know you can host those yourself they're pretty lightweight i don't think you even need gpus for it so if you have very specialized needs um you can typically get away with much lighter models yeah uh, you don't, and you don't need to pay for it um the problem is as soon as you even if you do that and you want to do retrieval based systems you eventually is going to run it that results through some sort of AI 
Mm -hmm. um, and often you might not have control over it. Mm -hmm. And there are now companies that take that data and try to remove the PII uh, from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't totally trust it, right, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to do the right thing, but some people are, are claiming that they can do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I know, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, ex-colleague of mine who works for NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is counting on the fact that they're going to sell a tons of GPUs and stuff to companies to run these things, right? Mm -hmm. The companies that are just going to have really high quality internal models and stuff. Um, and so NVIDIA is just expecting to make a killing from it. So it's probably even good to buy more NVIDIA stock, you know, because there's a massive shortage of uh, GPUs at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. recently had a, a session with some guys from Anthropic, right? And asked, can I get access to Claude? And they said, basically, you know, we'd love to give access to a lot of people, but we just don't have enough GPUs. We can't do it. They can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've got, I mean, if you guys don't mind, I would love to pick your, get your guys' thoughts on um, LK99 and the room temperature <laughs> superconductor. Okay. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look into this. Like, um, I've been following it. I'm actually going to stop the recording because I realized sure. I yeah. just have a